Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is our first Farming with Soil Life short course and we're really excited to have you all here. My name is Liz Robertson and I work for the Pollinator Program at the Xerces Society and we've got a really great course put together for you today and it's going to be led by my friends and Xerces Society colleagues Stephanie Frischi, Jennifer Hopwood, and Kelly Gill. And with that, um, thank you again for joining us today and I'm going to hand things off to Stephanie and the rest of our presenters. Great, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for lead, leading things off today and, and moderating today's course. Uh, good morning, hello everyone. Welcome to our online short course, Farming with Soil Life, Supporting Soil Invertebrates and Soil Health. Uh, my name is Stephanie Frischi. I'm an agronomist and plant ecologist with the Xerces Society. I provide uh, beneficial insect and pollinator habitat expertise throughout North America. And I also work with the native seed industry and, and researchers to plan and develop seed supply for important plant species for habitat restoration. Today, I'm joined by two other co-presenters from the Xerces Society, Jennifer Hopwood and Kelly Gill. And I will give a brief introduction of each of them. Jennifer Hopwood is a senior conservation entomologist with Xerces, and she provides resources and training for pollinator and beneficial insect habitat management and restoration in a variety of landscapes. She oversees a team of four USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service partner biologists and works closely with the agency of NRCS. Uh, Kelly Gill is joining us. Kelly is a senior pollinator conservation specialist and a partner biologist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Kelly provides technical assistance on pollinator conservation in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast region. Her work includes planning, designing, installing, and managing habitat for pollinators. And she also works with staff and research uh, folks to develop technical guidelines and provide training on pollinator conservation practices. So welcome, Kelly and Jennifer. Uh, a few, again, tools and reminders for anyone who's joining us a few minutes after Liz kicked things off here. Um, in the chat, there's a link that will take you to a, a packet of resources that are companion references and websites for today's course. So go ahead and open that. And again, if you're having any trouble, um, let us know in the Q&A. And then also we, we are recording today's session and at some point in the near future, we will post kind of a trimmed and edited version of this that, that we'll let you know about. Um, one of the, well, two of the links that are in that packet of resources are for shorter webinar style versions of, of this content. They're just one hour each. And they also have Q&A on the end of them. So those are other options to take if you want to um, have a, a shorter version to refresh and review or rewatch before we get today's longer version posted. Here's an outline in the schedule for how we'll move through topics this morning. Um, again, that's on the second, the same schedule is on that second page of the, the e-resources link. And if you want to, so if you want to check that anytime throughout the course of the day, that's where you can find the information. We are going to um, get going here and cover the basics of soil and soil invertebrates. Then Jennifer Hopwood will lead us in a deeper dive about soil invertebrates in module three um, with just about an hour's worth of, of teaching and information going through profiles about how to recognize each group, where those soil invertebrates live and what they're doing. We will then have a 20 minute break from 1040 to 11. And then don't be late coming back from the break or you'll miss out on our quiz. Um, and then in the remaining modules, we'll talk about scouting and monitoring, which are how to find these soil animals. We'll talk about uh, management practices and the effect that they have on soil life. In module six, Kelly will present about the programs that are available through NRCS to help farmers or farm owners implement these practices. And she has several nice case studies that are examples from farms across the Northeast as real world examples. 
Then we'll wrap things up by going over some more resources, a period for Q&A, and then uh, we'll conclude and have the brief evaluation that Liz mentioned. We know four hours is a long time to attend virtually and, and keep your attention there. So we've also built in several places throughout where, where we will be asking you to provide some input as well. And we're gonna just go to one of those, those times right now when we'd like to hear from you. Liz is going to open a poll here. Um, and this is really just to get a sense of who is in the audience. So the, the question there is, please select which category best fits your role or your interest in soil invertebrate conservation. So we'll give everyone a few moments here to select their responses. All right, we've still got lots of answers coming in. We'll give it another 15 seconds or so. Mm -hmm. All right, and oh, a few more coming in. Thanks everybody for participating here. And I'm gonna go ahead and share those results. Great, so yeah, there we get a nice little visual snapshot here. We've got um, representation from, from almost every possible group here and uh, a lot of people that are biologists, entomologists, or ecologists, also gardeners, excuse me, master gardeners or gardeners um, and some extension staff as well. So thanks everyone, glad to have you here. Okay. Next then, um, a bit about the Xerces Society here. We are an international conservation organization focused on invertebrates and their habitats. We were formed in 1971 by Dr. Robert Michael Pyle, actually as an organization of, of butterfly scientists. We are named for the butterfly pictured here, the, the beautiful and now extinct Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly to be lost to extinction in the US due to human activity. And so the, the goal of that first organization of butterfly scientists was to prevent the extinction of other butterfly species in the future. In the 50 years since our founding, we have grown to focus on many more invertebrate conservation topics, including in, adi in, in addition to butterfly conservation. We have around 50 staff, uh, across about a dozen states around the US. We have several program areas. We have a pesticide team who help to under, uh, help everyone understand and apply research in order to reduce the use and the detrimental effects of pesticides. Our pollinator team is the largest pollinator conservation team in the world. And we focus on conservation through the creation and management of habitat also through promoting agricultural biodiversity. This includes soil, and uh, all of us presenting here today are part of the pollinator team. Xerces also has staff focused on endangered species, such as monarch butterflies, especially Western, the Western monarch population, also certain bumblebee, other butterfly species, fireflies, and freshwater mussels. And we also have programs in communications and community. So these are the folks that help us put together and deliver wonderfully informative uh, publications, our YouTube channel, our outreach programs. We have an ambassadors program of volunteers who also help educate about invertebrates around the country and our B City USA program where towns, cities and campuses pledge to be pollinator positive. And all of our work is done through uh, using restoration, research, education, and advocacy to further our conservation mission. Um, getting back to today's topic at hand, I want to share up front and explain um, we have this 
wonderful publication, Farming with Soil Life. It's available to, to view digitally or to download from Xerces Publications Library. The link for that is also in, in your packet of resources for today's course. This handbook is over 130 pages with 266 images, and it just goes into more detail on the topics that we'll be covering in today's course. So we're really excited to share this with you. And then we have um, several more courses like today's plan throughout 2021. And each one will contain the same core content and information, but there'll also be several sections that are customized and unique, such as one focusing on pesticides, another one really focused on sampling and monitoring, another one with more of a climate focus. So as we have the, the details for those, we'll be publishing those announcements and registration links on our events page. And again, if you want to reach us for any reason around these topics of soil invertebrates, you can reach us at this email, soils at xerces.org. And we really could not do this work without the grant funding that Organic Valley and Northeast SARE have provided for our soil life curriculum. So I'd really like to acknowledge and, and thank them for that support this morning. Okay, so with that, we will get into um, module two here. We've done the first one, our welcome and overview. And here we'll talk about the, the basics of of soil and soil invertebrates. So first, um, just a refresher that invertebrates are the groups of animals that don't have backbones. Some are entirely soft bodied and some have hard exoskeletons or shells as an outer covering. Um, invertebrates are an extremely diverse group of organisms Nearly 70% of all described species on Earth are invertebrates. Um, and of all those invertebrates, about 95% of, of um, all, excuse me, 95% of all animal species are invertebrates. So as you can see on this pie chart here, sort of this, the green section um, are the vertebrate animal groups, amphibians, mammals, reptiles, birds, and fish. And then all the other segments in this pie are different invertebrate groups. And then within invertebrates, you can see that insects are the largest group in terms of the number of species. And of all these insects, only around 2% are estimated to be pests that cause economic damage to human interest or activities. Because in fact, um, that leaves 98% that, um, especially from our human perspective, we consider them allies and, and beneficial, and we really depend on them for, for life on Earth. And Xerxes' motto is protecting the life that sustains us. And really, the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own. Um, insects perform all these types of of functions. They're important for soil health, pest control, other ecological services, including um, crop pollination. So as are shown here in these photos, insects are important for their role in nutrient cycling and decomposition. We'll be talking more about the, those insect groups today. Also for how they, they balance or manage pest populations. Um, Insects also turn plants into food for other animals. And you know the way that birds really rely on caterpillars to feed their young chicks is one example of that. And then for us, many of the fruits and vegetables that we eat uh, depend on insects for their pollination. So again, those insects are turning plants into food for us as well. And then they also are important in their role in, in helping plants reproduce and sustain those plant populations.
Yet so many of um, the invertebrate and insect groups are in decline. Decline means that the number of individuals or the number of species are decreasing. In a telling study published in 2017, the biomass of insects in nature reserves in Germany, in Germany decreased by 70%. And this is in nature reserves where presumably insects would be the most protected from various threats. But despite that, um, such significant declines were measured. I imagine most of you can recognize the insect in this photo. It's a, a firefly or also known as a lightning bug. Um, it's fairly recognizable by most people. And I'm, I'm wondering though, did you know that fireflies are actually soil invertebrates? If you didn't know that already, you'll, you'll be learning more about that soon too. Pollinators are another group of invertebrates that are in decline by, by one estimate of a global intergovernmental report 40% of invertebrate pollinators may be at risk of extinction. I think um, the, the media and the news have covered the difficulties facing, facing honeybee populations pretty well, um, but honeybees are actually only one type of bee and they were brought to the US centuries ago from Europe. They're considered a managed species and they're non-native. However, in North America, there are nearly 4,000 other species of wild native bees. Um, and this photo shows one of them. This is the rusty patched bumblebee. So a Midwestern and formerly Eastern species, which was added to the federal endangered species list in 2017. This is the first bumblebee to receive or actually to need and receive this kind of protection. Um, however, overall, relative to other species groups, very few bees, butterflies, and other invertebrates are on the endangered species list. This doesn't mean that they're safer from extinction. It really points to how little attention has been paid to these species and their distribution um, to date. All right, another little question here. Is, is a bumblebee a soil invertebrate? What do you guys think? Okay, I hope this isn't a spoiler, but the answer is yes. Bumblebees can be considered soil invertebrates in addition to being considered pollinators. So not only um, bees and butterflies, but also predators or natural enemies, such as this tiger beetle, which is a species of the Eastern US pictured here, decline has also been measured in these predatory groups. Um, approximately a third of tiger beetle species and subspecies in the US are sufficiently rare to be considered threatened or endangered. So, okay, perhaps the fact um, that this beetle is pictured on a background or on the soil surface, it gives us a clue that tiger beetles, yes, these are also soil invertebrates. <clears throat> So almost anywhere that invertebrates have been studied, what's been measured is that they are in decline. But what about soil invertebrates? Well, actually our scientific and ecological understanding of soil invertebrates is still at a fairly basic level. This quote is from a recent review that looked at trends in invertebrate populations globally. And the, the author said that you know, for instance, soil invertebrates and soil dwelling larval stages of flying insects, um, which represent a major biodiversity pool in terrestrial ecosystems. These groups have been woefully neglected in many biodiversity databases and assessments, as well as in conservation actions and policies. So they're basically saying these are such important groups ecologically that they've been um, understudied so far. And so their recommendation is given that a major fraction of invertebrates live below the ground and considering their significant functional role, biodiversity monitoring urgently needs to include soil organisms and functions. And there are certainly research groups that, that do study soil invertebrates 
but um, compared to other insect and invertebrate research, less is still known about those groups. So it's hard to, to measure what the decline is if such, um, or what the status is of a lot of these groups since so little is currently known. Uh, this slide shows some of the, the four primary causes or categories of insect decline. So again, in almost every location or situation where they've been studied, insects are in decline. And these um, are the major causes for that. And then at the bottom of the arrows are the different actions that we can each take individually on whatever size farm or yard or flower pot. Um, that we may be caring for. And so with habitat loss, um, conserving and creating habitat is really at the heart of addressing the threat of habitat loss. Quality habitat doesn't only support pollinators, it's also important for natural enemies of crop pests. And adding habitat to a, a farm or an area or a yard will, um, as well as, as crop rotation, having a diversity of, of cash crops and other conservation practices creates a more diverse landscape and habitat. Um, another major threat, pesticides, and this includes insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, miticides, all the sides. Um, of course, these can impact invertebrates directly and indirectly, again, by leading to habitat degradation or loss. They can also cause non-lethal effects. Um, many herbicides that have been studied in honeybees have shown, excuse me, many herbicides and other pesticides that have been studied uh, in honeybees have shown how they actually affect the digestive system and the microbes that live in the honeybees guts and leads to, to poorer honeybee health and uh, overall wellness. So one of the solutions, of course, to that is reducing our reliance and use of pesticides through integrated pest management and also through adding more habitat and more diversity, which, which and that diversification really deconcentrates the type of plants that pests can eat it also helps to attract and support um, larger populations of beneficial insects that again balance any boom and bust pest cycles. The third threat is disease and non-native species or managed pollinator species such as honeybees or um, some, some bumblebee species are also managed as, as hives and moved around to, to pollinate crops or to pollinate tomatoes, for example, inside of greenhouses. So these uh, managed pollinators can actually concentrate and transmit disease to populations of wild pollinators. So again, trying to create diversity and a place where wild native pollinators can live naturally and pollinate crops is important. And then finally, um, with climate change, one way to address just all the uh, variabilities and the changing trends and the higher extremes and lower extremes is again by creating more diversity that's better able to withstand drought, extreme rainfall or late or early frosts. And then also perennial cover of vegetation can help capture and hold carbon in the soil rather than releasing it to the atmosphere. Um, this is a map that we can look at to see how we kind of currently use land in the continental US. It's, a, it's based on USDA data uh, for the lower 48 states. These are grouped by broad use categories and then these colors are overlain to kind of show relative size. So, the yellow represents land that's managed as pasture or rangeland. Green are forests or tree farms that are managed for timber and other products. The brown is cropland. Blue is special use. Um, these are kind of actually what was categorized in here are natural or wild areas. So national and state and local parks. 
um, gray, excuse me, um, also Department of Defense Land and Golf Courses, and gray was miscellaneous. And then pink is uh, urban areas that are covered in buildings or pavement. And then this is that same data and kind of the same broad color categories, but broken down into um, some subcategories. And so I think if we, we look again here at the yellow, which again was rangeland or, or pasture for livestock, that was the, the largest single category. And then all the brown or tan areas are the crops. So all that land that we use for food production is not an insignificant um, amount. So the, the message here is just to encourage you, whether you're uh, managing land in, in pastured areas, in cropped areas, or in the pink, in, in urban areas or your yards, um, each of us can have an impact on how we manage that, that land for pollinators, for soil invertebrates, and all of that diversity. Okay, um, next we'll switch here just to a bit of soil basics. And I really wanna, I, I'm calling this soils magnificence. The, the more I learn and think about soil, it, it really is magnificent. Again, from a perspective of human utility, there are several main functions that we can categorize soil as having. It's a medium for plant growth and habitat for wildlife. Soil is also critical to regulate water supply and filter water. Soil is where all the recycling and storage of organic matter happens. And then also kind of anywhere we are on land, whether we're directly walking on, on soil or we're in buildings or on roads, Soil underlies all of that, and so it's also important uh, for where and how we build or construct things as humans. There are five main factors involved in soil formation, which is also called pedogenesis. And those five factors are the parent material, that's basically the, the type of bedrock or mineral source that soil is derived from. There are the organisms that live in and among the soil and also help to shape it. This includes plants as well as animals, as well as bacteria and fungi. There is also climate, which affects how soil forms, topography as well. Um, and then finally, time. So the, the duration or the length of period that all these factors are interacting with each other. And the photo here, I think, um, shows the effect of a lot of those factors together. So um, I believe here, I believe this is in on Long Island. So you know there'd be um, some some granite and limestone as parent material. The organisms here are just plants, but of course there are other animals present that we can't see. Uh, and then topography, you can see here how the, the larger rocks and pieces are falling down with gravity and then smaller pieces sort out that way. So topography really has an effect in terms of how gravity acts on these particles. You can also see um, how processes are working to form soil and processes are considered things like weathering um, or organic matter accumulation or actually loss of organic matter as well. So that's just a, a bit of a refresher about the, the, the interactions of these different factors and how soils form. There are also several ways to describe and categorize soils. Uh, physical types are talking about texture, aggregate stability, um, bulk density of soil, some chemical characteristics are the pH, the cation exchange capacity, and other measures of fertility. There are biological ways to measure or categorize soil, such as through respiration or measuring microbial diversity and abundance. 
And then other ways that soils are categorized may be uh, through their color or the age of soils. And there's also a whole soil taxonomy where soils are organized into orders and then also into series. Um, here we're gonna just take a little pause and have Liz open the, the chat. And we've got a question for you. It's got an open-ended answer. And we'd like to ask you to please reply in the chat. So at your farm or yard, what is the soil type? And there I'm, I'm, we're mostly interested in if, if you know what soil series um, your farm or yard is. Uh, additionally or alternatively, we'd also like to know what's the soil texture like at your farm or yard. And so that would be whether it's more sandy or there's more clay, um, maybe it's a little bit rocky or there's a lot of silt or loam texture. So go ahead and we'll take a little time to, to let people fill that in in the chat. Great, we've got all kinds of good responses coming in here. I'm not gonna go through every one, but um, we're seeing Sandy Loam, Clay Loam, Martinton Silty Loam, Claremont Cincinnati, Kiowa. So those names are, are different soil series. They're often named after the, the location where they were first described by soil scientists. And then you can search online and actually find descriptions of soil series. Mollusol, um, that's one of the soil orders. So in soil taxonomy, words that end in that suffix, S-O-L, which is related to our word for soil, um, that's how you can identify when someone's talking about a soil order. So mollusols are typically soils that formed under grassland vegetation and they actually make for rich, fertile farmland. So a lot of the soils in the Midwest and sprinkled throughout other areas that were historically grasslands have these mollusols. Okay, thank you everyone for sharing about the soils where you live in the chat. Um, we're gonna, I think Liz, you can leave that open or close, whatever makes sense there. And we'll move on here again. And now talk a little bit about soil health. Um, so beyond simple intuition, one technical definition of soil health is the degree to which soil is optimized to support various ecosystem services. Um, there's also the definition by John Doran and Michael Zeiss written here. It's the capacity of soil to function as a vital living system um, within these different land use boundaries to sustain plant and animals and, and humans. One regenerative farmer that Xerxes has worked with has, has described it as when he's able to decrease external inputs while maintaining good and stable crop yields. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna have to jump a little bit ahead here for, for time, but we've got the four soil health principles featured here on the right. Two of them are really focused on protecting soil and on the left, Two are focused on feeding the life in soil. And we'll talk about these again later in the session, but I wanted to introduce those here. And then get on to uh, soil invertebrates. So this is really the focus for our short course, that soil is full of life from the tiniest microbes, bacteria, fungi, and protists, and increasing in size to mesoinvertebrates, macroinvertebrates, and also, of course, including land plants and vertebrate animals. Um, 
this slide is just a preview as we're getting ready to go into the, the profile section here in module three. So just wanted to highlight all the roles that soil animals, especially soil invertebrates play. And we could not live without all these, these functions and roles. And again, one teaspoon of soil has been estimated to contain more living organisms than there are people in the world. This is really talking about the estimate of 1 billion bacteria, several thousand protozoans, so these very tiny microscopic animals, and then getting into nematodes and many other fungal filaments and other tiny animals. Just quickly, we're not gonna talk um, much at all about bacteria and fungi, but they are an important part of soil life. Bacteria are the most abundant soil organism. <clears throat> they feed on carbon, contribute to decomposition, and they are eaten by the micro and mesofauna. They're also really important in their role of transforming atmospheric nitrogen to forms that are available to plants. Fungi are also very abundant in soil. They decompose, decompose the plant residue and break it down and make it available for other roots. They help regulate pathogens. And they also multiply the capacity of roots to absorb water, nutrients, and tolerate drought. And the reason why I want to show this image is to illustrate the flow of energy in soil um, ecology. So this, the green arrows show the direction and relationship of energy flow between these groups of organisms. This, this does not show living plants and their roots or larger animals, but it really zeroes in on the organic residues, uh, mostly dead or shed material from plants and dead animals as well. That's the green triangle at the bottom left. And then if we look at bacteria circled in orange, we see this movement or transfer of energy and decomposition, but these are short networks. They don't really um, connect directly to the other groups that are pictured here. And then if we look at, at fungi in the blue rectangles, you can see how fungi really uh, connect the organic residues with the mesoinvertebrates and then up to the macroinvertebrates. So with that, I'm gonna um, stop and switch over to Jennifer for module three. All right, thank you, Stephanie. All right, <laughs> great to be here with everybody this morning. Um, I'm covering all the little critters that you can find in your soil, all the invertebrates in your soil this morning. So we're gonna take a deeper dive into those groups right now. And as Stephanie mentioned, um, soil contains a vast diversity of life. <clears throat> Nearly 25% of all the organisms found on the planet are soil animals. So it's really an incredible, an incredible source of diversity. These animals range from absolutely microscopic to totally visible to the naked eye to quite large. One way to think about and visualize the abundance of life in the soil is this illustration here. This represents the life found in a square meter of soil. It's, it's not to scale, <laughs> but as you can see, the smallest organisms, the bacteria and the fungi make the base of this pyramid. They're the most abundant. And then as soil creatures increase in size, fewer and fewer are found within that square meter. And soil life needs creatures both big and small. All this life exists within this really intricate web with all these different organisms dependent on one another for survival. There are a number of ecological roles that soil animals can play. Decomposers are those that break down plant and animal material into pieces that bacteria and fungi can more easily use. The smaller the particle of leaf material, for example, 
the more niches and pores that bacteria can occupy to continue to break it down further. Um, for example, the population of bacteria increases significantly on plant material after it passes through the gut of a soil animal. So these decomposers, animals are really a critical part of the decomposition pro process. There are also soil animals that enrich the soil. Um, animals that tunnel or burrow in the soil mix nutrients and minerals between soil layers and that influences soil fertility as well as soil structure. Those burrowers and tunnelers <laughs> are soil engineers. Their work also um, carries air and water into deeper layers of the soil, which helps to aerate and hydrate the soil. Um, they create channels within the soil that allow plant roots to penetrate a little bit further. Plant roots really like to grow through the path of least resistance, for example. So their work is really essential to the structure of the soil as well. And then, of course, there are also a lot of different roles that soil animals play within food webs. They can be herbivores or plant eaters, they can consume fungi or bacteria, um, or they're predators of other soil animals or parasitoids of other soil animals. And Steph mentioned some can be pollinators as well. So there is just a ton of life happening underground. And because much of it is happening out of our sight, we are really going to spend some time showcasing some of these animals and their role in soil health. We're really going to particularly focus on those organisms that contribute to agricultural soil health today, um, but recognizing that there are a lot of other soil invertebrates out there that play, role in, play a role in other soils as well. We're going to start with the smallest of organisms that you can find in soil. The protozoans are less than one millimeter, so they're very much viewed only with microscopes. And protozoans in the soil used to be considered animals, but now they have their own kingdom um, of their own entirely. These are single-celled organisms that are mobile and obtain food from other sources. They can't create their own food. Um, they move in different ways, and that's how we group these different groups of soil protozoans, amoeba, have cytoplasmic extensions uh, that they use to move themselves along. The testate amoeba move the same way, although they have a harder shell that, um, that surrounds their cytoplasm and they just stick their little extension outside of the shell a little bit at a time. The ciliate amoeba have little hair-like extensions that are are cilia that help them move, and the flagellates have one single whip-like extension that they use to propel themselves around. All protozoans in soil primarily feed on bacteria as well as fungi and, um, and algae as well. And as they feed on bacteria, primarily they release nitrogen and importantly in a form the plants can more easily accessed. So a lot of the nitrogen that can be found in plants comes from protozoa that help to transform it. And protozoans are found from uh, deeper, shallow, or excuse me, shallow, shallow soil layers as well as deep, and as deep as 200 meters. So they are really some of the um, organisms that exist in, as deep as, as we know. Moving into soil invertebrates. So that Protozoans are the only group that are not animals that we're talking about today. And from here on out, we're focusing on soil animals that are invertebrates. And that covers 99% of all the animals that are found in soil. And Stephanie mentioned invertebrates are animals without backbones. And just a second here, I think I've got an issue with timing on my slideshow. So just one minute. All right, so soil invertebrates are animals without backbones, and most of this group are made up of insects. About 80% of soil invertebrates are insects. Um, but to su suffice it to say, soils are really home to some of the most diverse communities of 
animals that you can find on the planet. So jumping into some of these invertebrates, uh, these are rotifers. They live in water films along with protozoans, and they are also best viewed with a microscope. Um, they can be recognized by their crown of cilia that are found um, towards the head. They use these to spin and create this vortex that they use to draw in food. They eat bacteria and protozoa, fungi and algae. Um, they're, in fact, their name rotifer comes from the Latin word that means wheelbearer. So those wheels are really quite distinctive for rotifers. They have a little foot, which you can't really see here, but foot-like thing that they use to anchor to surfaces when they want to, to hold tight or um, that they can use to scoot around within the water, the water film. Water plays a very important role in <laughs> the world of rotifers. And when that water dries up, they form a cyst-like structure, which is a stage of resting animation that allows them to survive in that dry conditions. So um, <clears throat> that's really important for soil rotifers to make it through dry spells. Another group that's found in water films and that are also microscopic are tardigrades. And tardigrades are known as water bears as well. And as you can see from these microscopic pictures here, they do superficially resemble bears. They've got stubby legs and claws. And the way that they move is really a little bit lumbering, like um, the mammal bears that we know. Tardigrades eat slightly larger animals um, than rotifers do. For example, they'll feed on nematodes and rotifers as well as bacteria and protozoa, fungi, plants and algae as well. And <clears throat> they too really depend on that water film for their survival and can also enter a state of suspended animation when that water dries up. Most of the water leaves their body, their metabolism slows way, way down and they can be very long lived in that cryptobiotic state in fact, up to 30 years, but possibly more. There have been um, a number of folks have, that have experimented with revitalizing tardigrades from old museum specimens of moss, for example. Tardigrades are quite possibly the most resistant and hardy animals that we know of on the planet so far. They are really resistant to radiation. They can survive really extreme temperatures anywhere from 250, negative 250 centigrade, all the way up to 150 centigrade. Um, they are also the only known animals that can survive without oxygen in the vacuum of space. So these are incredibly hardy uh, animals that are pretty ubiquitous in our soils. Our next group are nematodes. And these are among the most numerous animals on the planet. There's a quote from a um, an agronomist in the 1920s who worked with the USDA. And he said that if we took all matter off the face of the planet, we could still see the outlines of mountains and the lines of lakes um, just by the film of nematodes that would be left behind. And so this is another group that's really omnipresent in soils. And nematodes are unsegmented worms. They're fairly transparent and they're tapered at both ends. Nematodes have a wide range of um, food sources and um, the, the mouth parts help you to distinguish what they eat. In this illustration here on the left, you can see a nematode that has um, lips that grasp bacteria. So it's a bacterial feeder. In the middle, you've got a nematode with piercing sucking mouth parts that puncture and suck roots or um, fungi. And then on the right, this nematode is a predator and has teeth to help hunt rotifers and tardigrades and, and other nematodes. Nematodes live in water films within the soil or within pores if they're larger in size. Many nematodes are microscopic, but some are visible to the, to the naked eye. Nematodes <clears throat> develop from eggs and they have 
for juvenile stages before they become an adult. And um, many species have separate sexes. Some have both sexes within an individual and hermaphroditic. Just like tardigrades and rotifers, they depend on water films in the soil for gas exchange. And when that water dries up, they can also enter the stage of cryptobiosis. Nematodes in particular can survive a long time in this state, much more than we realized um, just a few years ago. In fact, um, scientists revitalized nematodes from glacial deposits that they estimated to be about 30,000 years old. So um, absolutely incredible that they can survive that long. Um, nematodes can be found as deep as about 2.2 miles in the soil. <laughs> and some of the plant feeders that feed on roots can um, cause damage, economic damage to crops like soybean and rice and corn. There are also some nematodes that are um, internal parasites of other invertebrates as well as vertebrates. And then um, as you can see in this picture here, this is a little bit unusual, but there are a few fungi that will actually trap nematodes and um, prey on nematodes. This particular species of fungi right here forms a constricting ring around the body of the nematode and then breaks it down slowly over time. Um, soil nematodes can be important indicators of soil quality. Their presence correlates with, with nutrient cycling and plant growth, and they can also be really sensitive to chemical disturbances and physical disturbances. Um, the only downside with using nematodes as indicators is that there aren't very many people who can identify free moving nematodes. Our next group of invertebrates are potworms. So these are slightly larger worms that you can view with the naked eye. So they're much larger than many nematodes. They're typically white. They're segmented, so they have segmented bodies. And potworms are smaller than earthworms in size. They really live in the upper soil layer and they feed on decaying material um, as well as bacteria and protists and they influence soil structure through their burrowing and mixing of organic matter and minerals. So they are ecosystem engineers on a small scale. A more familiar group are quite likely these earthworms. They are also segmented worms and have a tube-like body, just like potworms. Um, unlike potworms, they're, they're quite a lot larger and they do have a structure known as the clitellum. This is a, a structure that houses reproductive organs. If you've ever wondered which end of the earthworm is the head versus the tail, um, look for that smooth band. That's um, the clitellum and it's found closest to the head. So earthworms burrow within soil. Um, they consume leaf litter as they go, as well as actual soil itself. And their burrowing action, as well as their digestion of soil and leaf litter can improve soil porosity. It increases water infiltration. It transforms nutrients. Um, they can move an incredible amount of soil um, one estimate is that they can move 10 tons per acre per year of soil. So earthworms obviously have some pretty significant benefits. It's also worth mentioning though, that there are a great number of earthworms found in the United States that are introduced species, about one third. And it's thought that glaciation removed a lot of the indigenous earthworms found in the central portion of the United States. So it's really only the Pacific coast and the eastern states and southern portion of the east that have native earthworms. Um, in, in all those places where we have native earthworms as well as those places where we had no native earthworms, we now have lots of different introduced species of earthworms that have been here um, for any number of years um, introduced by European settlers. And then we have some species that were introduced more recently. And some of these species might be beneficial in some settings and some might be detrimental in others. 
Um, for example, there's a group of introduced species known as the Asian jumping worms, and this is at least 15 different species of worms. These worms can deplete leaf litter, and they also aren't um, mixing nutrients within soil layers as some other earthworm species do. So their presence actually increases erosion and causes nutrients to be lost from the soil, as well as reducing habitat for other species that rely on that leaf litter layer. So um, this is all to say that earthworms are not always the superstars of soil health in every single place and in every single setting. All right, from here on out, we're gonna focus on uh, groups of invertebrates known as the arthropods. These are invertebrates that have an external hard skeleton on the outside of their body. They also have segments in their bodies and they have jointed appendages. And there are really four large groups of arthropods. There are um, the hexapoda that include the insects, there are the myripoda that include millipedes and centipedes. There's chelicerata that includes spiders and mites. And then lastly, the crustacea, which include wood lice and crayfish. And um, because arthropods do have an external skeleton on the outside of their body as they grow, <laughs> they need to shed that external skeleton in order to continue to get larger. And different arthropod groups go through different transformations. Um, there's two general types of metamorphosis. Um, incomplete metamorphosis have, those groups that go through incomplete metamorphosis have young that look very similar to the adult. Um, and they also feed on very similar food sources and they're found in similar habitat. So this includes arthropods like mites and spiders, and then um, insects like true bugs and grasshoppers. There are also groups that have complete metamorphosis and these include insects like beetles, ants and flies that have life stages that look very different from one another. So they go through four distinct phases, egg, larva, pupa and adult. And in each stage, um, they look quite different. They can live in different habitat and the two feeding stages, the larval stage and the adult often have different food sources. So that's just background as we go through some of these groups. And um, particularly when we get to um, the insect groups, <laughs> we'll talk about what the different life stages need for those groups that have complete metamorphosis. So our first group of arthropods are mites. And mites have two main body regions. They have a, um, a large abdomen and a small cephalothorax area with, that holds their, their um, head and their locomotory structures. Um, mites have eight legs, six as immatures, and their lifespan can vary quite a lot by, by species. Um, they usually look pretty small and have those rotund bodies. And what's really amazing about mites is they can be one of the most diverse groups in the soil. Um, they're also one of the most abundant. So about 40% of all the small arthropods that you might find encounter in the soil are mites. And they are um, super decomposers. They are really essential for breaking down organic materials into bits that bacteria will use. So this includes plant matter, um, but can also include um, animal matter that's already started the decomposition process, they break it down even further. There is also a group of mites in the soil, the mesostigmata mites, that are predatory on smaller soil life, like springtails and nematodes or insect eggs. And as they're moving through the different soil layers, because mites can be found not just at the soil surface or in the upper soil layers, but also in deep layers, they move fungi and bacteria as they travel through the soil layers, and that is uh, important as well. I mentioned that mites have um, different lifespans that can 
vary. Some have very short lifespans of just a few weeks. Some can live longer, up to three years. Um, and that just to, that can just vary with all the different species. Might uh, faunal communities um, can be very specific to soil type. So if you've got a specialist soil on your land, it often has very unique mite communities. Mites do, <laughs> um, they don't have wings. So if they want to travel long distances, the way that they often travel is by hitching a ride on um, insects. <laughs> you can see in this picture here, this is a darkling beetle and it's got a group of mites hanging on to its legs. This might look like these mites are parasites of this particular beetle, but really they are just, just traveling um, from place to place by clinging on to that insect. And the last thing I wanted to mention is um, because of their close ties to the soil, um, tillage does reduce the, the work of predatory mites that might contribute to crop pest control. Our next group are springtails. Springtails get their common name from a structure that they have on the underside of their abdomen, seen here with this orange arrow. This is a furcula, and it really is just a propelling structure that moves these animals across and through the soil um, in a springing motion. Many columbula um, or springtails are globular and have this round rotund body. And a few also have a more elongated body like you can see in the upper picture here. Um, some springtails live in deep soils and those springtails have often um, a reduced circular, reduced spring and also have lost their eyes. And within, whether they're in soil deeper layers or they're up on the, the soil surface or within the leaf litter layer, they contribute to decomposition by fragmenting plant material and fungi. Uh, but they also eat bacteria and rotifers and nematodes. And through this predation, they can influence soil microbe communities to a significant extent. Our next group are wood lice. <laughs> this is the only group of crustaceans we're going to talk about today. Most crustaceans are found in water and um, wood lice are um, one of the few that have moved on land, but still um, water is very important to them. So wood lice are typically only found in moist areas under logs and stones and moist soil. Um, they appear to have armor almost. Um, they have two pairs of antenna, seven pairs of legs, and um, you may have known them, or at least I knew them as roly-polies growing up. Um, it's pill bugs that can roll into a ball, uh, but there are also sow bugs, which look very similar to pill bugs, except they are unable to roll into a ball. And they can be distinguished by the two appendages that stick off of the tail end of their body. Uh, wood lice are really important decomposers. Not only do they break down detritus, uh, plant material that's already undergoing decomposition, but they also break down fresh plant debris and have bacteria in their gut to help them break down that fresh plant debris. And some even have particular preferences of the species of fresh leaves that they like to chew. Um, a few also will feed on roots or seedlings and can sometimes be problematic in that context. Like earthworms, a good portion of the species that we found we have in North America are introduced originally from Europe. So about one third of the wood lice species um, that we have in North America are introduced from Europe. And this includes all of the roly polies, <laughs> all of the pill bugs. Um, in fact, native wood lice tend to be more diverse in North America in littoral areas, along shorelines, um, in caves, and then also in the south. And for similar reasons as, as earthworms, it's, it's thought that glaciation had some role to play in, in reducing diversity of wood lice. Um, wood lice actually live for several years, so they have a longer lifespan. 
And interestingly, too, the mothers provide maternal care and actually feed their young with secretions from their, their own bodies. Another really interesting thing about this group is that they can tolerate heavy metals and they accumulate them within their body. So if you're looking to monitor contaminants within a system, monitoring wood lice and looking at their bioaccumulation can tell you something about the contamination levels. Now we're gonna to turn to some larger, significantly larger arthropod groups, um, physically larger <laughs> anyway. Um, these are millipedes and these have very elongated bodies. They have segments of course too, and they have two pairs of legs per segment. So this gives them this appearance of having many, many, many legs. And in some cases they do have hundreds of legs, uh, though their name millipede means a thousand feet. There actually is no millipede on the planet that has a thousand feet. The upward limit of feet for millipedes is about 750, which is still a lot. Um, millipedes have chewing mouth parts and they use these chewing mouth parts to break down um, plant materials in particular. And they are really super decomposers. They are responsible for fragmenting up to about 15% of annual leaf fall example, and they significantly facilitate microbial decomposition. Um, millipedes are also really powerful diggers, so they can excavate deep um, soil tunnels in which they overwinter and, and rear young, so they contribute to soil health in a couple different really important ways. Um, this is another group that can be long-lived, and significantly so, they can live up to 11 years, so they do re reproduce a little bit more slowly. And the, um, the females also provide some form of care for their young. For example, they might guard the nest or um, help bring food for their young. Um, closely related to millipedes are centipedes. They look quite similar, although their segmented bodies are often a little bit more flattened. They're not quite as round. And they do have fewer legs with only one pair per segment. And another striking difference of centipedes is that instead of chewing mouth parts, they have pincer-like piercing mouth parts that they use to inject um, venom into their prey. So these are all predatory um, rather than decomposers. They'll live in all layers of soil as well as on the soil surface hunting um, their prey. And they can be very excellent hunters. Many are um, nocturnal and they can be quick at running um, and quick at tracking down their prey. Centipedes can also be quite longer lived and will also provide care for their young. Another important group of predators are spiders. Spiders have um, two body regions like mites. They have an abdomen and they have the cephalothorax, their head and their thorax that's combined. They have eight legs and they have multiple eyes. And um, spiders can also inject their prey with venom to slow them down or to start digesting them and can also be useful diggers as well. And the the spiders that we often see the most are hunting spiders that are found on the soil surface or leaf litter. These are spiders like wolf spiders or jumping spiders or ground spiders. But there are also other spiders that live in the soil that use webs that they spin either across the soil or they create a tunnel or tube within the soil and line it with silk in which they trap and then ambush their prey in, in, uh, within their web. And spiders can um, be fairly long-lived, anywhere from one to three years. They can be slow reproducers. They only have one generation a year. They do overwinter in the soil, either as adults or eggs, um, as well as in leaf litter or in old stems. And for this reason, um, they really rely on permanent plantings in agricultural settings. Um, so they can't really survive within an agricultural field from year to year because there's too much disturbance. 
but if they have permanent habitat nearby, they can move back into the agricultural field in the springtime. Because they are long-lived and take a little while to reproduce, disturbances like insecticide applications or um, tillage can um, impact their populations. It can take them a little while to recover. Um, spiders also produce, provide maternal care. And you can see in this picture here, this is a wolf spider, female. And it's a little hard to tell, but she's carrying just a ton of babies packed on her back. And she'll carry them around for quite a while. And um, let's see, I think that's it for spiders. All right, Liz, if you wouldn't mind opening the chat, we're gonna have a question for you. And I think we wanna hear from you. Have you thought about soil and vertebrates in your work today or in your life today? And if so, if you could tell us a little bit about how, we'd just like to hear from you about your thoughts on soil and vertebrates. Hey, we've got some good responses coming in. Thank you so much. Folks have thought about them in their compost or um, in work with farmers and ranchers for soil health. Um, some folks mentioned that they just have, have known about earthworms. Um, I think earthworms are certainly a gateway, gateway animal into the rest of soil, um, soil invertebrates. Some folks have thought about them in the nutrient cycle. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, wondering about how to provide habitat for them. And certainly we're definitely going to talk about that a little bit later. And food for birds, that's for sure. They're food for a lot of other animals. Trying to boost spider populations. That's wonderful. Leaving leaves. Yeah, thank you so much for all these responses. All right. Let me get my time. Okay. Um, next up. So from here on out, I'm going to um, just be covering insects only. We've talked about a lot of different groups of arthropods, and then we've talked about a lot of other groups of invertebrates. But from here on out, we're focusing on insects and Insects are those animals that have three body regions, they have three pairs of legs, and they have one pair of antenna. And not all insects have wings, but many do as well. The head section of, of insects include the mouth and associated parts for food manipulation and sensory organs. The thorax, the middle section, contains um, the locomotion organs and structures needed um, legs or wings. And then the abdomen contains internal organs and reproductive organs and so forth. And um, as Steph mentioned, there's a huge diversity of insects on the planet. And although we have estimates of about um, 1 million to 1 and a half million species identified so far, some people estimate there's about 5 million species of insects out there and we just haven't discovered them or identified them properly and named them properly. So there's a lot to learn about this particular group of animals. And there are a ton of different groups of insects that live in the soil or that have a portion of their life cycle in the soil. I mentioned earlier that 80% of all soil animals are insects. So there's a lot of insects out there and we are um, not able to cover them all today. So pictured here are some of the groups that play a role and live in soil, um, like burrower bugs or grasshoppers, cockroaches, termites, antlions, cicadas, 
earwigs and mole crickets, but we're really going to highlight those groups that are most important and have special value to working lands on farms today. I'm gonna to start with flies. And for the sake of time, I'm grouping a whole bunch of different flies together. And this particular group of flies are all important decomposers of plant material. As larvae, they break down decaying plant material in the soil and are really can make really notable contributions to the decomposition of leaf litter. Um, these flies include crane flies, which you can see pictured up here in the left-hand corner, which are often mistaken for really large mosquitoes. <laughs> they do look somewhat similar, but have very different lifestyles. And then we have dance flies here, non-biting midges, um, long-legged flies with their metallic bodies, and they're often found on flowers. Moth flies, which can be found near damp areas typically. March flies, this is the larva stage of the march fly in the adult. And then snipe flies, which have this gorgeous yellow patch on their back. Some of these flies as adults do visit um, flowers for nectar. Some need nectar to keep their energy going and some actually don't feed as adults. But um, all in all, it's I just wanted to make them point that there are uh, quite a diversity of fly species out there that are really important in soil systems as decomposers. Another important group of flies are the flower flies. And these adults um, are often found on flowers where they drink nectar or sometimes pollen. They have a coloration that can sometimes mimic bees or wasps, usually fairly brightly patterned. Their larvae though are gray green, they're legless, they're pretty unassuming, but they're absolutely um, really <laughs> pretty powerful. Um, in this particular picture here, you can see a little larva that's um, hunting an aphid. <clears throat> um, some flower fly larvae live within the soil or leaf litter and break down um, decomposing plant material. Others are predators within leaf litter or soil hunting other soil animals that are small, and then some do move up onto vegetation and hunt animals like aphids. So this is a group that contributes to decomposition, but also is important in the control of crop pests and can provide um, conservation biological control on farms. They're also, um, as adults, I mentioned that they visit flowers. This is a, a group that it can be very important pollinators of crops as well. They're in fact, one of the most important non-bee pollinator, pollinators of crops. Um, flower flies overwinter in the soil or leaf litter. And because of the close relationship that adults have to um, flowering habitat, they need some sort of permanent flowering habitat in order to survive because pollen and nectar are so important to survival and to reproduction. And moving into the beetles, this is another group that contributes to crop pest control and as well to potentially to pollination. <clears throat> the adults have leathery wing covers and elongated bodies. The larvae, on the other hand, um, have dark elongated soft bodies, but really hard sickle shaped jaws. It's the, um, <clears throat> the larval stage that are often really important hunters in the upper soil layers and in leaf litter. Um, they will also hunt prey on plants. They hunt <clears throat> for um, smaller insect legs or sm smaller insect larvae like aphid or insect larvae as well as small insects like aphids, but they will also eat larger soil animals like slugs or snails. Um, the adults also can be hunters, but many um, just consume larvae, uh, excuse me, pollen and nectar. And in this way, they're often found on flowering plants. And as they move between those flowering plants can sometimes transfer pollen. So soldier beetles do superficially re resemble this next group that we're talking about. These are the fireflies. Fireflies also have these leathery wing covers and they have um, luminescent segments at the end of their ab 
women, both the adult and the larva have luminescent segments and they use those organs to um, attract mates by flashing patterns at dusk and at nighttime. The larva are predatory and they're very good hunters. They will seek through leaf litter, um, upper soil layers, and um, occasionally um, tracking down slugs by following their slime trails or searching earthworm burrows <laughs> to track down earthworms. So this is a um, really interesting group in that I think they have this lesser known connection to the soil that can be really important. Um, also, the larvae do tend to overwinter in the soil as well as potentially um, under bark and pupation can occur in soil leaf litter. So they're all the fireflies that we see flashing, showing their beautiful shows um, in the Northeast and other parts of the country, that is all tied to the health of the soil as well. Our next group are tiger beetles. Um, tiger beetles have smooth wing covers, quite long legs. They have really prominent eyes. They're often metallic in color, so they can be very colorful. Some are, are more gray, but often still have a metallic sheen to them. So those are the adults. The larvae, on the other hand, um, are a little bit more cryptic. They um, burrow in the soil. The adults start out by laying eggs within a burrow in the soil, and then the larvae usually dig further into the soil to create this burrow they will anchor themselves in. You can see they've got a little anchor. They will anchor themselves to the side of that burrow. They've got a flat head um, and they will usually hide these massive jaws that they have underneath that flat head. So they look a little bit innocent. And then as an unsuspecting animal crawls by, they will pop out and um, pull them into their burrow and consume them. And these larvae are actually pretty long lived. They can take two to three years just to mature into adults. So they spend a lot of time in the ground developing. Um, the adults on the other hand are also predatory and they um, actively hunt on the soil surface and sometimes on plants. They are very, very fast, they can be. And in fact, um, one species of tiger beetle is the fastest known insect on the planet and runs equivalent of 5.6 miles per hour. So um, are very speedy and pretty hard to catch <laughs> if you've ever wanted to get a closer look. Related to tiger beetles are ground beetles. They look quite different, but have a lot of other things in common. Um, ground beetles have ridged wing covers. They're a little bit larger than tiger beetles. Often they are not metallic. They're more often dull colored, black or brown. Um, the larva, however, do have massive jaws, just like tiger beetles. And both the adults and the larva are, are excellent predators. They can be particularly important in consuming um, and controlling crop pests like slugs and snails, grasshoppers, herbivorous beetles, caterpillars, and so forth. This is a really important group in conservation biological control. Um, not only do they have this important role as predators, but there are some species that also contribute to decomposition by breaking down um, detritus and some that also eat weed seeds. <laughs> so this is a really a valuable group to have on your land, whatever that land looks like. Then ground beetles lay their eggs in the soil and then some Females will provide some care and look out for those eggs defending them. And I mentioned that the larvae and adults are both predatory. They hunt and, and um, eat similar types of prey. Um, most are most active at nighttime. This is a long lived species as well. They can live up to four years and they do have slow reproduction with just one generation of growing season. Um, so that means that insecticide kills or um, tillage in particular, because that can disrupt their, their eggs and their overwintering and can have big impacts on their population that can take a while for them to recover from. They also overwinter in well-drained soil or in clumps of bunch grass. 
And for that reason, they don't persist within a, a cropped field, for example, over time, because they need that permanent habitat. So what some growers have exper experimented with is actually creating habitat within a crop field for these beetles because they're so important in um, pest control. And this habitat is known as a, a beetle bank. And it's a small earthen ridge. It's maybe two to five feet wide, um, raised slightly and planted with bunch grasses that runs the length of the field. Ground beetles will move into that habitat in the fall and over winter, and then move back into the crop in the spring. Our next group are rove beetles. And rove beetles have very similar habitat needs and very similar prey as ground beetles do. So they're found in very similar places. And they also respond to similar conservation measures. Um, however, they do live deeper um, in deeper soil layers than ground beetles do. They do have um, short wing covers, so that's a quick way to distinguish them from ground beetles. And they will often elevate the tip of their abdomen when they're running. Um, those ground be uh, rove beetles that live in deeper layers of soil often have even more reduced wing covers <laughs> as well. Um, these beetles are really quick runners. They're good hunters and um, they eat all sorts of things. So they'll eat all sorts of different soil animals, uh, mites and slugs, small to large, and will also eat some detritus and um, contribute to decomposition as well. Uh, because they do move within the soil quite a lot, they can contribute to mixing of soils as well. Our next group of beetles are the brain beetles. And this includes um, two groups of beetles. The burying beetles that you see at the top have more elongated bodies with red, red, orange, and black coloration. And then there's a group related to them um, known as carrying beetles with a more round body and um, that's more often black with a little bit of yellow or orange on its thorax. Um, both of these beetles feed on Carrion. They're really experts at finding carcasses and can find them really quickly, um, identifying them from up to two miles away. <laughs> um, because carrion is considered to be a hot commodity for a lot of different animals, carrion beetles try to um, try a couple different strategies to keep their carrion protected and reduce competition for it. Um, carrion beetles lay their eggs directly into the carrion as it lies and um, they develop pretty quickly, but their larva will also eat fly larva that might be competition for the decomposition of that um, animal carcass. Burying beetles will actually dig beneath the carcass and, and cause it to sink in the ground to, and then they'll lay eggs on it after they cover it up. So in that way, they're trying to reduce competition as well. Um, the decomposition of carrion is particularly important because carrion is so nutrient rich that it can really influence soil fertility significantly as well as all the plant communities nearby. Hey Jennifer, this is Liz just with the 10 minutes till break time, time check in. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I mentioned that burying beetles will move it to a better spot. Uh, they will bury their carcass to protect it, they'll move it if they need to, um, to a better location to help them dig. But as they're digging it beneath it, they process the carcass. So <laughs> they take away the hairs or the feathers or whatever is there. They're destroying any fly larva that might be competition. They shape it into a ball and they also secrete a whole bunch of substances onto that carcass to slow down microbial decomposition so that it serves as a better food source for their young. And they can bury it fairly deep, as much as 60 centimeters or more. And then they'll lay their eggs on it. The larvae that then develop are fed by their parents that regurgitate food. And that type of parental care in which not just the mother as well as the father are contributing is really pretty unusual in insects. Um, the larvae of carrion beetles, on the other hand, pictured here at the bottom, they are not quite so helpless. They are not fed by their parents. 
they're kind of on their own um, and they feed on the carrion as fast as they can. They also, I mentioned, will feed on um, uh, uh, um, fly larva or other small beetle larva that might be competitors for that. Um, both groups overwinter in the soil and pupate in the soil. And um, this isn't, I mentioned earlier that mites will hitch rides on different <laughs> insects in particular to move from place to place. And this is particularly notable for carrion beetles and burying beetles because um, the mites can get exactly where they want to go, which is to get to carrion where they also will feed on fly larva or small beetle larva. Um, and then they'll just hang on to the adult carrion beetles as they move on to the next carcass. Um, next up are dung beetles. Uh, dung beetles have this oval body and um, scalloped legs, which they are used for um, digging. The larvae are C-shaped grubs that are found within dung. This is a, another group of beetles that's really good at finding their food source. Um, they're really excellent flyers. For example, um, they can fly up to 30 miles identify dung from quite a long ways away. And they're really good at removing dung. Um, they can move it, remove it for some, in some cases up to a day or a few days. It's estimated that dung beetles remove about one ton of dung per hectare per year, which is a huge, um, a huge amount of dung. So their work is really, really critical for um, the health of grazing lands. It improves the palatability of forage for livestock. It also reduces the habitat for parasites of livestock. So um, screw worms and hornworms often develop within dung. And so the very presence of dung beetles breaking down that habitat reduces um, parasites of livestock. They also disrupt um, dung feeding flies that carry E. coli. So this reduces the spread of foodborne pathogens on farms as well. So there's all these incredibly valuable services that they provide on farms as well as grazing lands. Um, this is estimated to be worth about $380 million a year. It's almost certainly worth more than that. Dung beetles have a couple different strategies for, for securing dung um, because it is like carrion, a hot commodity with lots of animals competing for it. And um, those that are dwellers lay eggs directly in the pat and will also kill fly larvae that are competition. So um, in that way, they, they reduce those pest flies I mentioned earlier. Um, there are those dung beetles that will dig a tunnel beneath the pat and then move dung into those tunnels. And then those are, there are the rollers, which are perhaps most well known of dung beetles that form a ball with the dung and then move it away from the pat before digging a nest underneath, moving that dung into, into that nest. Dung beetles can be fairly long lived, up to three years, and some develop a little bit more faster than others. Dung beetles, because they feed on dung, anything that is applied to the cattle that moves through their gut and into the dung can affect dung beetles, including um, parasitic treatments like ivermectin, which can be very harmful to dung beetles, and that in turn can prevent their ability to decompose dung. One more quick fact about these dung beetles, the rollers <laughs> need to move their rolls as fast as possible away from the dung patties um, to reduce competition because there are other dung beetles that will try to steal their balls and all sorts of other things. It, it's only been recently discovered that, that they use polarized light from the sun and take sort of a mental picture of the sky to help them find the most efficient and fastest route, but they can also use other celestial cues when it's darker, including the moon and even the Milky Way. Our next group are ants. And um, ants have, um, just like bees and wasps, constricted waists and elbowed in, um, in particular, to ants, they have elbowed antennae. Ants live in large colonies and build extensive nests underground. Their excavation and mixing of soils makes them one of the most significant insects found in the soil. Um, for example, in Massachusetts, uh, one study found that ants moved through 30 tons of soil 
per acre per year. So they are moving a lot of soil. And in this process, they're integrating nutrients, helping to aerate and hydrate. And they also play other roles in the food web. They are predators. They contribute to plant decomposition and animal decomposition. They move seeds. This is just a, um, a really superstar group. I mentioned they live in large colonies. Ants have a truly social lifestyle. So um, there's individuals in the colony that perform specific roles. The queen is the primary reproductive role, and it's the queen that establishes a nest. She finds the site, and then she produces brood, her young, and those grow into workers that care for the colony and are working as foragers or soldiers or nurses or other roles. So these colonies are multiple year colonies um, and can be really extensive. In this picture in the top left, this is a plaster cast of an ant nest taken um, by the man in the picture, Walter Tinkle. Um, these nests can be up to 12 feet deep and can have tens of thousands of workers within them. Um, he called them nature's grand architects. And one quick note about um, a particular group of ants found in the Northeast, there's formica species. These are mound building ants. They can build these slightly raised mounds that are about two to three feet in diameter and raised about a one to two feet sometimes. They're really essentially earthworks and you can find them in grasslands as well as forests. There are a lot of other critters that live within um, ant nests as symbionts or um, or just receiving benefits from being present within the ant nest. Um, uh, but they, they never are harmful to the ant nest, only providing, um, receiving benefits from being there and sometimes providing some benefits as well. Next up are our ground nesting bees. 80% or so of all the species of bees found in the US nest in the ground. These can be fairly shallow, a few centimeters up to a meter or more depending on the soil type, because different species have very specific preferences for soil types. It's the female of, um, of bees that provision these nests, they create these nests and then provision them with pollen and nectar. And in gathering enough pollen and nectar to feed their young, they make many, many trips between flowers. And that is one of the reasons that bees are such really critical pollinators, um, not only of crop plants, but also of wild plants. Um, ground nesting bees can nest in agricultural fields. Um, in this picture here, you can see several nest openings. This is within a sunflower field, and each of those nest openings leads to um, the nest of another of an individual. So most species of ground nesting bees are solitary, and um, the work build a nest is just done by one individual. So it's not this um, extensive colony situation as you see in ants. Although there are some species, as Stephanie mentioned quite, a, quite early on, that bumblebees um, can be uh, soil animals as well. And some bumble, most bumblebees do form uh, more social colonies, but much smaller than ants. So in this picture, you can see the work of one individual solitary bee. She's dug this deep tunnel that leads down to um, separate chambers. She's probably got about 10 chambers, depending on how much time she has to um, excavate them and then provide them with food. Inside the chamber, this is a ball of pollen and nectar. That's food for her young. Um, she'll lay an egg on top and the larva will develop on that ball of pollen and nectar. Um, many ground nesting bees will secrete a substance to line their nest, just to create sort of um, a waterproof protection around their young to help them survive fluctuating um, soil moisture. Some bees um, have just one generation a year, so you could only find them flying in the spring or the fall, for example, depending on when they emerge, or some have multiple generations and you can see them throughout the growing season. And then there are also some bees that specialize on the pollen of a particular species of plant or on a closely related group of plants. And pictured here are squash bees which is a, a genus of bees, uh, or actually several genera now, that do visit um, plants only in the genus Cucurbita for pollen. And so have a very um, 
closely tied life cycle to cucurbita plants and can be very important for the pollination of um, pumpkins and squash and zucchini and so forth. Closely related to ants and bees are wasps. And um, much like um, ground nesting bees, there are a number of ground nesting predatory wasps, most of which are solitary. Um, the solitary lifestyle means that they aren't aggressive in defending their nest. They aren't likely to sting um, unless their life is threatened in some way, as in you step on them or accidentally grab them and squeeze them. Um, but they're otherwise not going to defend their nest. They're not going to fly around and, and try to sting you in any way. Bees, unlike bees, are predatory. They feed their young arthropods like grasshoppers or crickets, aphids, stink bugs, caterpillars, and so forth. Some focus on a specific group and have particular preferences, like the sand wasp down here at the bottom um, tends to prefer things like stink bugs. Um, the cicada killer wasp pictured in the right hand corner focuses on cicadas only, um, but others are, are more generalists. This is another important group for conservation biological control. They can really significantly contribute to crop pest control. It's the adults that are found on flowers and drink nectar, and they are the ones doing the hunting, but it's the larval stage that are the predatory stage and actually consuming those insects. Um, lastly, another group of um, wasps that are important to conservation biological control are scarab hunting wasps. These adults drink flower nectar and found on flowers, and the females then hunt for scarab grubs. So they'll dig down into the soil once they've found scarab grubs and lay eggs nearby, and then their young eat the scarab <laughs> grubs slowly over time um, in order to develop into adults. So all these different groups that I've been talking about so far, I've been highlighting all the beneficial roles. There are a couple of groups that eat living plant material as well, so they might feed on roots. And in some cases, this includes groups that can be crop or ornamental pests. Um, this includes scarab beetles, um, wireworms, which are the grubs of clickworms. It can be grubs of weevils. Um, it, and there are also a few groups of moths that have caterpillars that feed on plants. So these are herbivores. And as I mentioned, some can cause economic damage. But in a balanced system, there are also all these other predatory groups that I've talked about that help keep these herbivores in check. And that also goes for um, other groups that have some members that can be crop pests like snails and slugs. About 20% of snails and slugs can contribute to crop, it can be significant crop pests, but groups like ground beetles and fireflies, rove beetles, soldier beetles, these are also really important predators of slugs and snails. And then for good measure, even though they don't really play a role in soil health, on working lands, I wanted to mention the periodical cicadas because they are having an emergence this summer in the east. Um, periodical applies to cicadas that are in the genus Magis cicada, and they require 13, to seven, 13 or 17 years to complete their development. Uh, they live underground for that time, feeding on tree roots, and then they emerge in mass in the springtime, usually uh, about May or June. And the adults uh, will climb on the trees and then sing this really cacophonous song to help them find a mate. And then they'll start the whole life cycle over again, laying eggs and trees, and then the larvae drop down from the canopy and bury into the ground and feed on tree roots for another 13 to 17 years. So it's a really <laughs> incredible um, life cycle. I just wanted to highlight briefly. All right, so Stephanie mentioned earlier that really soil animals do so many things for us. They have a huge influence on our lives. They break down plant and animal material. They take complex chemicals and transform them into simple compounds. They can alter soil structure, mixing nutrients, improving water infiltration, and all of those actions enhance plant producti productivity, which is hugely beneficial for those of us raising um, crops for food or for shelter, for fuel. 
they help contribute to climate regulation, they control um, the populations of other wildlife, their food sources for wildlife, and they contribute to pollination. So <laughs> really they're hugely foundational for our life above ground. <laughs> And hopefully we've given you the snapshot of some of this amazing life that's happening below ground. Um, because I've gone a few minutes over, um, I'm going to um, pass on questions for now, I think. And Stephanie, you let me know if that's not OK. But I think it makes sense for us to take our break. And um, do you want everybody to be back at 11 AM Eastern? Or would you like people to be back at 5 past? They went a little bit over. What do you think? I think we, Steph, might have gotten cut off, but let's come back at five after. Thanks, Liz. Liz. And thanks, Jennifer. Hey there, everyone. Sorry, I had to restart Zoom there for a moment. Um, yeah, we'll we'll be back here after a, a break. So please stretch your legs and refresh, and we'll see you back at eleven o five Eastern time.
Okay, hello everyone. Um, we're gonna be concluding our break period here. So please come back to Zoom if you've left and, and join us again. Thank you, Jennifer, for the previous session on all the wonderful soil invertebrates and telling us about who they are and how to recognize them, where they live and what they do. Um, we're now gonna do a short quiz to just help, help cement some of that information in our minds and help support our learning. Um, and that will be through the Zoom poll function. So Liz, if you're ready and able, that will pop up. Great, there it is. So there are um, four questions for you to scroll through. Just take a look at that. And again, if you're having any um, technical challenges here, please reach out to us in the Q&A. And we'll give about another minute here to let everybody get a chance to read through and submit their answers. Okay, so yeah, thanks everyone um, for, for coming back and joining us after the break. We currently have a little quiz popped up in Zoom. And um, by the time I finish talking, I think we'll give everyone their, their last chance to submit their answers. We have four questions. First, which of the following are some of the ecological roles that soil invertebrates play? And then a few other questions about specific groups that we just that Jennifer just covered in the previous section. Um, how does it look, Liz? Does it look like we could go ahead and close that or should we give people a little more time? Yeah, I'm going to give it till the 15 more seconds and then we'll wrap it okay. up. Then. Sounds great. All right, so I'm going to close this down and then we'll share the results. Okay, so everyone I think should be able to see the results. So the first one, um, I hope that, that Zoom worked correctly here. You could choose more than, than one. And actually the correct answer is all of these. Um, some soil invertebrates are predators, some are decomposers, some are pollinators, and, and some are food for other animals. So everyone did really well in, in recognizing those roles. Number two, the question was, uh, this common group of soil invertebrates is found throughout the Northeast, yet many species are non-native. The correct answer here is earthworms. Um, and I'm just gonna pull up the, the slide that Jennifer shared before. So when we, when we look there under agricultural or ecological role, there it says, 
there are some introduced species that deplete the leaf litter and do not mix nutrients within soil layers. So yeah, earthworms are not uh, like an all-in-one. They're either good or they're, they're bad. It's a little more nuanced and complicated than that. I also noticed a few of you put some questions in the Q&A, specifically wanting more information about jumping worms. So um, I think we'll see how we are on time, whether we're able to address that now. We'll probably hold, hold those questions and get to them during the official Q&A session. All right, next quiz question was, which of the following is the smallest soil animal that we've talked about in this course? We had springtails, wireworms, tardigrades, or potworms as choices. And the correct answer was tardigrades. Again, um, these were one of the, the first groups that Jennifer presented in the mesofauna size class. And they're, they're pretty small, you need a microscope to, to view them, but they're quite busy and active as predators and scavengers eating all kinds of other organisms that are smaller than they are with those spinning wheel kinds of mouths. And the last question, which group of soil invertebrates is critical for livestock farmers? Dung beetles, correct. Just as a reminder, of course, these, these soil invertebrates are really good at, at using their chemical senses to seek and find dung, and then it's part of their reproductive cycle um, for both mating and laying their young and provisioning those young. Okay, that concludes our, our quiz session. And we'll go ahead and, and get into module four here, where we'll talk about uh, methods for scouting and monitoring. Now that we know some about what these groups of soil invertebrates are, what are ways that, that we can start to observe them and look at them a little more closely and learn about which ones are on our land. So um, this, this photo here in the foreground, you can see a sticky trap. So that's like a piece of waxy cardboard that makes it somewhat weatherproof. And then it's also treated with a real tacky kind of substance. And they may or may not be baited with um, a type of chemical attractant, but also the yellow color is attractive to many insects, but this is also just, you know, catching anything that lands on there. Um, so it's not, it's a common method for scouting insects in crop fields, but it's not the best method for detecting soil insects because you know, it's, a, it's above the crop field here. Um, behind what we are actually observing there, I'm holding a, a pitfall trap that we put out the night before, and now we're looking at the contents. And that, that brings me to, to talk about methods for observing soil invertebrates. Sometimes it's really as easy as just putting down a board or lifting up a rock or a brick or something. You know, you can, I th I'm sure many of us have had the same kind of experience where you pick that up and you may see a few earthworms, or in this case, we have um, an earthworm kind of at the top left, a beetle grub there. And I think there's a few other like tiny um, millipedes kind of curled up in the center. So that's of course a very quick way to, to observe soil animals. Um, there's both formal and informal sampling. So informal just, just means you're casually observing these and formal is where you set it up with a more strategic or uh, research grade type of experimental design in terms of the, the quantity that you're trying to, to sample, where you set your traps, and how many replicates you do. In, in today's session, I'm just going to talk about these types of, of trapping or, or observation methods, the pitfall trap, a Berlazi funnel, and a Berman funnel. And then again, some of the other equipment that's needed for these methods are pretty accessible, um, just some, some plastic dishes, possibly just some soapy water with dish soap in there, a dissecting microscope if you have access to one of those, some needles and tweezers for holding or manipulating 
the invertebrates, and then a hand lens or another type of magnifier that can be used in addition to or in place of the microscope, and then um, some references. So um, if, if you're not familiar, you know, there's a, a dissecting microscope, which will have a separate light source. It's not the kind of microscope where you put in a, a, a glass slide or, or that kind where you're looking at very small things. The dissecting microscope kind of just lets you magnify in on parts of the, the insect or invertebrate. And now there are these USB camera microscopes, and they're they're widely available. I think a lot of them are available for a price point that's under one hundred dollars. And you can just put them on your desk or tabletop, plug them into your computer, and then the image is actually projected on your computer screen. So it's another really comfortable way to magnify and, and look at these invertebrates. The hand lens is also pictured there. That's used by jewelers, by geologists, by botanists, and by entomologists. Um, the scientist here, she's holding one in her hand. It's quite a small kind of lens, so that's something that's easy to have in, in your pocket as well if you want to zoom in and, and look at specific parts of, of those insects. References, again, um, our Farming with Soil Life Guide is a wonderful tool for helping you categorize or identify um, which insects you've observed. And there's also a lot of different online sites like Bug Guide or like iNaturalist, which also have communities where you can post your photos or your questions and have other experts help you to identify what you found. The, the Berlazi funnel is, um, a pretty simple method on the left is pictured a more DIY or homemade version. And the two photos on the right show what an actual research entomology group might use, but the concept is the same. You, you collect kind of the top layer of soil and the, the leaf litter that's on top of the soil. And you place that in a container that's funnel shaped. And then the top, of it is exposed to um, a light bulb, which is both light, a source of light and a source of heat. And then the funnel has a narrow opening at the bottom and that opening fall, goes into a container, which is either dry or as you can see in the, the right side photos, it may have some type of liquid, um, usually has a killing ingredient in there. But what happens are any of the soil invertebrates that are in that top soil layer or leaf litter as the light shines on them, that heat and light drives them away and downward until they crawl out or fall out through the bottom and into that um, dish that's there to capture them. These are often operated for several days at a time, um, but that's something you can easily build from kind of disposable plastic items that you may have at home. And then the, the Behrman funnel is really used for observing nematodes. This is a bit more specialized and it consists of taking your soil sample, also putting it in a funnel, but there's special filter paper there and it goes through different um, cycles of kind of rinsing or washing the soil with water, collecting that rinse water and then the nematodes will collect at the bottom of that. And then since they're so small, you do need a good dissecting microscope to observe them. But that's what that method is. Uh, pitfall traps are kind of what they sound like. You dig a pit, you put a container in it that can be removed. And when you do that, you put the rim of the container flush with the soil surface. And then you fill in um, any gaps around it with soil. So that's kind of a, a constant surface. Um, you leave this for a set period of time, usually overnight. And what this is going to help capture are some of those meso or macroinvertebrates that are on the soil surface. And often those groups are, are active at night, um, which is the reason for, for leaving these traps out overnight and then checking them fairly early in the morning on the next day. Um, that the container that you use in the bottom, you can leave it dry or empty. If you're going to check it fairly quickly, that should be fine. You know, what falls in there will stay alive. You can have an issue if um, you get some predatory beetles that fall in there and they start eating 
other animals that have fallen in there. And then, you're, then you miss being able to observe what else was in there. Um, so to avoid that, or if you're going to leave it for a few days, you could put in, again, a liquid like soapy water, which will help to immobilize and, and kill whatever is caught or falls in there. On the left, you can see you can also use some wires or nails to set up a small cover to keep other large debris or rainwater out of the trap. And then um, on the right, this is an, another kind of version of a pitfall trap where they are actually trying to catch dung beetles. And so they have baited it with dung in the middle, that little smaller container that's being suspended over the pit part has some, some dung in it. So again, that, that smell of that attracts the dung beetles and they climb towards it, but then fall into the cup. Uh, pitfall traps are a great, easy way to begin observing soil invertebrates. Again, they can be used informally by anybody or as part of a formal research study. And really the way to use them is repeatedly use them over time and over different locations to compare what soil invertebrates are there by season, to compare by what type of vegetation is there, uh, or also you can compare between different management types, like a, a crop, excuse me, a, a crop field that has cover crops versus a, a crop field that doesn't have cover crops. Xerces has this really nice, it's just a double-sided single sheet. It's a soil scouting guide. And the link to that is in your reference materials. So the front side has a set of instructions about how to do pitfall trapping, which is kind of what I've just described. And um, here's an example that I did on the farm where I live near West Lafayette, Indiana. And this was last year in late September. So the top row is a trap I put out in a cornfield. Uh, this field is, is conventional, but they, um, they do some no-till or, or reduced tillage. And there's also cover crops. I think if you can maybe see like um, um, a grass cover crop had already been flown in. It had been seeded in by a, a plane and some of those small plants are germinating there, those little green blades. Then the second habitat that I sampled is the kind of cool season Eurasian perennial grass roadside along the edge of that field. And the third site is the adjacent cattle pasture area that just has a lot more plants and wildflower diversity as well as cattle and cattle dung. Um, the, the cups on the right correspond to what I, I trapped. This was just one overnight trapping again in late September. That's fairly late in the season. You can see just how all these, both the corn and the other vegetation is kind of drying up. Um, but in, in the cornfield, what I found were springtails and a few ants. In the roadside, I found a few uh, field crickets. And then in the pasture, I found quite a few field crickets. That, that soil scouting worksheet has the backside that looks like this. So it's a place for you to record your observations. And this is what the version looks like for the example that I just showed you. Um, kind of put the date and time and some of the other environmental conditions there about when you did this sampling. And then this sheet is really designed again to look at, at beneficial insects that are on the soil surface. So there's a column for how many ground beetles, how many ground dwelling spiders, and how many tiger beetles were observed. And in my case, I had um, none of those groups. Um, but if we look then, going back to this food web slide, we'll look at what I did find. So again, the pitfall trap that was in the cornfield was mostly springtails, and this is where they are. So they're feeding mostly on fungi and other smaller uh, organisms in the soil, but then they provide food for some of these predatory groups. Um, here again is just a reminder is the, the slide that Jennifer presented about where they live. Um, so, you know, it's not surprising to find them through pitfall sampling. They're in the leaf litter. They're also on the, the soil surface. They eat decaying plants, 
fungi, bacteria, pollen, rotifers, nematodes, and other springtails. So again, in that cornfield, um, think you know what's what's in, being indicated is that there's a little bit of those food sources there for the springtails. I guess hypothetically, like what could I interpret differently if I had found um, a lot of ground beetles in those traps? Or in another field, you know, I've been to some, a farmer here who does a lot of cover cropping and we've put pitfall traps in his crop fields and they just fill up with ground beetles. And what that indicates is the much more complete or complex and fuller uh, ecosystem in those fields. Because you can also, also think of these, these predatory groups as really the wolves or kind of the, the apex predators of their little system there. And so obviously if you have a system that's able to support ground beetles and a lot of ground beetles, that's indicating that all the other um, pieces in that food web are also there in that, in that field or that site. Okay, so that was just a, a bit of an introduction um, on ways you can informally measure soil invertebrates. I'll do a quick overview of the management practices here. Um, this is a slide we've seen before, but again, these were the four main um, threats that affect invertebrate abundance and diversity. And again, if we look at management practices, which ones are contributing or part of these threats and which ones are counteracting these threats. Uh, here, I'll be able to take a little more time on this nice diagram of the four soil health principles. So the right-hand side is really focused on protecting the soil by minimizing disturbance. Um, so reduced tillage or no-till is part of that. Maximizing soil cover, um, that can be relay cropping or cover cropping, so not having fields that are bare over the winter. And then the left-hand side is really about uh, maximizing the continuous living roots, excuse me, feeding the life in soil by maximizing continuous living roots and maximizing biodiversity. There's one piece here that I think bears mentioning it's also important that you don't do things, do, don't do other things that kill um, organisms, such as applying pesticides. So, in a way, that's implied, you know, by maximizing biodiversity. But I wanted to specifically mention that as well. So, we look at some effects of tillage or fertilizer or pesticides and how those can be damaging. Of course, tillage is going to lead to desiccation. It breaks the fungal hyphae, destroys tunnels of these soil invertebrates, and it also destroys other burrows or nest sites. Synthetic fertilizer causes um, all kinds of spikes in nutrient availability, and then certain organisms are going to spike with that and, and then kind of fall. So you have this boom and bust cycle instead of a more stable, balanced system and also any excess amounts are lost to the water or atmosphere. So they're causing kind of other harmful effects downstream. And it's also money that's not being spent that's not really um, getting into the crops or the field. And then pesticides, um, they lead to both the direct and indirect negative effects on these soil ecological communities. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend as much time talking about this slide, but this is a recent study that compares the non-target organisms that are being impacted by, by pesticide toxicity over the past 25 years. So the target organisms are these typically invertebrate pests. Non-targets are the vertebrates, shown here as fish, mammals, and birds, and the non-target uh, invertebrates were grouped into the aquatic ones, pollinators, and then terrestrial arthropods. And these trend lines are just showing how much these different groups are exposed to chemicals that are toxic to them, to pesticides that are toxic to them. And because the type of chemistry that's been used in pesticides has changed over this 25 year period, you can see that's that's been good actually in terms of its toxicity for these vertebrate groups. Those trend lines are decreasing. But on the right hand side, uh, for all of our invertebrate groups, 
they're they're being more impacted. Um, in many cases with pollinators, they their um, the toxicity has doubled in that time period. And you know, this is in large part due to the use or the, the transfer of away from organophosphates and carbamates and into the pyrethroid and neonicotinoid chemistries. This is the image from our uh, publication, How Neonicotinoids Can Kill Bees, that just shows all the different ways that pesticides can move throughout the environment away from the, the targeted area where they were meant to be applied. And then for the most parts with these different management practices, that we can make choices about. Um, there's one side of them, which is helping to support more soil life, such as less tillage, less synthetic fertilizers, less or no pesticides and higher above ground diversity. And then on the right-hand side of this table, these practices are gonna lead to less soil life, kind of the opposite of those. And with that, I will wrap up this section and um, get started on module six with Kelly. Let's see, Kelly, Liz, how are we doing there? I'm Good, it looks my, like, oh, there she is. I'm getting everything started as we speak here. She's getting it, okay, fabulous. <clears throat> is that coming up on your end, everybody? It is, you'll just need to swap the display settings. Okay. Oops. Where did my display settings go? It looks full screen on my end. Is it still showing up not full screen on your end? Yeah, we're still seeing the presenter view. Um, it looks, I can see the display settings button at the top there, but it might be blocked on your screen. It looks like it might be blocked. Um, oh, geez, this was very easy during practice. <laughs> um, let me see if I can. There we go. Good? Uh, not quite, it's, it hasn't showed up yet. Is it shared? Should be um, showing up on my end here. You know what, let me turn my other screen off. I think if you try resharing your screen in Zoom, that should do the trick. Okay. Thanks everyone for hanging in there. Yes, yeah, sorry everybody. <laughs> That's all right. Perfect. All right, you're all good to go. All right. Thank you everybody for hanging in there with me. Things tend to shift around depending on what mode you're in. Um, 
I'm going to talk about USDA conservation programs and practices. I noticed when we did the initial poll to get to know the audience that over half of you responded that you were um, a conservation planner or had another staff position with NRCS. So this will be familiar to you. It's just an introduction. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with the uh, USDA NRCS, that's an agency. NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's an agency within the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. It got its start as the Soil Conservation Service back in the day of the uh, Dust Bowl to conserve, um, you know, the main work they were doing was to conserve soil and moisture on working lands. And it evolved over time to looking at other resource concerns, which we'll talk about today. So in the early 90s, uh, the name changed to Natural Resources Conservation Service to kind of reflect this broadened scope, uh, scope of conservation. And we'll look at these, the way this is organized, we're gonna talk about some of the programs. So these are federal programs um, administered by the USDA or some of our sister agencies. And then we'll whittle it down and talk about specific practices under those programs for soil invertebrates. Um, we're not gonna be able to cover all of them because there's a lot. So I hope this just gives you a sampling of some of those practices that are um, going to be beneficial to conserve and protect the soil invertebrates that we've been talking about today. So NRCS programs and practices address specific natural resource concerns. Two of these that are especially relevant for beneficial soil invertebrates are soil organism habitat loss or degradation. So the objective to address that resource concern would be to improve habitat, right? Pretty straightforward. Terrestrial habitat for wildlife and invertebrates. Again, the objective is to improve the quantity and quality of habitat to meet the requirements of those terrestrial wildlife species. And as we've been saying today, you know, these soil organisms, invertebrates and insects are animals, so they do fall under wildlife, although sometimes not as well recognized as some of our big charismatic megafauna. So three cheers for the columbula and all of the other tiny, um, but very instrumental animals in our soil that often get overlooked. So the programs that we're gonna talk about are largely funded by farm bill dollars um, and USDA NRCS, so the Natural Resources Conservation Service, I'm gonna say NRCS from now on, provides technical and financial assistance for these farm bill programs. This funding comes from taxpayer dollars. And so there are a lot of different programs and they, and they work differently. And um, there are some requirements you have to meet to be involved in these. And that's because we wanna spend those taxpayer dollars um, really making big change on the landscape, right? So one of the things NRCS does is provide what we call uh, conservation technical assistance or CTA. You'll learn there's a lot of acronyms in the um, NRCS world. So I've put those in here. And what that is, is just one-on-one -one, one -on -one advice and information based on science and research. So if you are a farmer or a rancher or a private forest landowner or the general public and you have questions on conservation issues, um, you can contact us. We can point you to lots of resources. We can answer questions to the best of our ability, along with conservation planners and soil conservationists. NRCS in each state has specialists on staff, and so they might be able to point you to somebody with specific knowledge in that area. And this is to help producers make informed decisions, to share resources and tools, right? These are publicly available. We also have programs that offer financial assistance. So this is for implementing practices that address those natural resource concerns. So we have to come out um, and actually do assessments on the land and verify that, yes, you do have a concern 
uh, for habitat for terrestrial wildlife, or you do have a soil health concern or a water quality concern. There's a lot of other um, resource concerns beyond what we're talking about today that fall under wildlife. And if you implement practices to address those concerns and you become eligible for funding and you have a contract, you could get paid um, a flat rate, a certain amount for implementing those. So what this is is incentive to cut down on the cost to make our landscapes and our working lands um, more sustainable and have them enter into these conservation uh, practices. So for those for that financial assistance, again, you must meet eligibility requirements and you must be addressing a natural resource concern on your land. And those natural resources concerns, we use the acronym SWAPA plus E. And what that stands for is soil, water, animals, plants, and energy, right? We've recently added energy to the, um, to the list of resource concerns. And if you're working with us, with the Xerces Society, we have partner biologists um, throughout the country that work directly with an RCS in a partner position providing technical assistance. So you may be, you know, you may talk to somebody at your local NRCS office and ask about soil invertebrates, but the person you're talking to may not know as much as some people that are entomologists or have been studying this or specialize in that area. So what our role is there is to kind of increase the capacity for these planners and help them understand, you know, what needs to be done to address specific um, resource concerns. So in that way, our partner positions are kind of acting as a specialist. Um, we also provide technical assistance with pest management conservation systems, which you can imagine from what Stephanie uh, was talking about earlier about the impacts of pesticides, so reducing those impacts is very important as well. And some of the um, you know, most common programs, this is not all of them, but I'm gonna introduce some of the most common programs that within those programs have practices that address soil health resource concerns and also animal resource concerns. So that combination of both healthy soils and healthy soil life. Okay. So EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, again, addresses natural resource concerns. These can include, but are not limited to, limited to soil health, improving soil quality on agricultural lands, improving habitat for wildlife and invertebrates, including beneficial insects, and also crop-based or field management practices that can protect soil invertebrates. Um, examples are, are things like reduced tillage, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Under the EQIP program, there's also an organic initiative and NRCS provides assistance here to help organic producers, existing certified organic producers, um, to improve their operation and meet national organic uh, practice standards. We can also help interested producers that are not currently um, USDA organic certified to transition to that, right? So this can be the development of a plan tailored to their needs. And that can be what we call conservation activity plans or specific plans for certain practices that can help transit that farm transition to organic and also can be part of the organic systems plan. Another program is the Conservation Stewardship Program. This rewards producers that are already implementing good stewardship practices, but um, you get an annual payment, but you're also expected to continue those good practices and add on more what they call enhancements. And these enhancements, um, there's a lot of them. And there are, a lot of them are analogous to EQIP practices. So they'll use the same practice standards, but the program is set up a little differently. And then we have the Conservation Reserve Program. And this is administered by our sister agency, the Farm Service Agency, 
but NRCS still provides the technical uh, end of the technical assistance for this program. So you would have to go to FSA to do paperwork um, and eligibility requirements and all that for uh, the conservation reserve program. But you work, we work with FSA, NRCS employees do, to provide that technical assistance. And this is a program where you're retiring land that's in production um, in environmentally sensitive areas. So highly erodible areas in areas like the Chesapeake Bay watershed where we have water quality issues. Um, and this is a larger commitment. So you are agreeing to set aside that land, stop crop production and grow permanent cover um, or create buffers along waterways that um, you know, end up being a 10 to 15 year commitment. Right. So to learn more about these programs, I'm a biologist, you know, as Stephanie introduced me earlier, I work on pollinators and beneficial insects. I am not a programs expert, but you can contact your local field office and get all those answers about the paperwork, the process, eligibility, um, where to get started, who to talk to. And you can do that online through, um, if you just Google contact NRCS, it will come up with a map and you could select your location for your local field office. Now I'm gonna talk about some practices. Um, all of these, well, not all of these, but the, what I will showcase today are taken from our Farming with Soil Life Handbook. So that's what this course, as just as a reminder, is based on. And if you look at pages 117 to 123, you'll find a table that lists um, several over 30 or an overview of 30 35, excuse me, NRCS practices that support beneficial soil organisms. That doesn't mean it's all inclusive, but these are very commonly implemented practices. Um, and for more information on these practices, you can also visit NRCS Soil Health webpage. Um, there's also a lot of resources on those pages as far as information, fact sheets, and so on. So using that in tandem with this Farming for Soil Life um, book will give you a really broad overview of these practices and whittle down to some specifics here. Like you see in the last column here, that provides a, a little description of each practice. Again, just a reminder, you know, these are based on um, uh, these what we are calling resource concerns or what NRCS calls resource concerns and they're defined by the agency. So we're going to be looking at soil organism habitat loss or degradation and terrestrial habitat today. But there are other resource concerns um, that these programs and practices help to address. So as you can imagine, um, practices like cover crop which is available um, through EQIP and through different CSP enhancements um, is really vital, right? So what NRCS likes to use is the little rhyme, discover the cover. Keeping that soil covered when it's not in crop production is critical. And this can be grass or grains, small grain species like you see in this picture here or it could be flowering species or a, a multi-species mix. Um, what this does is it covers the soil, prevents erosion, it helps to smother weeds, it helps retain moisture and build soil, right? Um, the use of flowering cover crops has another layer of benefits because it provides forage for these beneficial insects and pollinators. Now, pollinators is probably obvious, but a lot of the beneficial insects we talked about, for example, hoverflies, um, you know, in that larval stage, they're predators, but in the adult stage, they need flower nectar, right? They switch their diets. So having the best of both worlds here, providing that short-term foraging habitat where they can, where insects can access nectar and pollen resources along with that cover is critical. And here are some examples here going left to right, you see buckwheat, sunflower, and then you see a cool season mix of grasses and uh, vetch. A couple other flowering cover crops, you know, you'll recognize these crimson clover, other clovers are brassica species. Um, partridge pea is a, a perennial or short-term, short-lived 
legume that we often put in pollinator mixes, but it's fairly cheap seed and it's a very high quality resource for uh, bees and beneficial insects. So the key here is not just planting these, but allowing them to flower before they're terminated, right? or a percentage of them to flower. Um, here's a case study, just oh, again, emphasizing the multiple benefits of cover crops. Um, in this study, when flowering cover crops like buckwheat, like you see in this picture here, were planted near soybean crops, that increased uh, wasp parasitism. So these beneficial parasitic wasps that attack pest insects, um, it increased wasp parasitism of stink bug eggs. This particular wasp parasitizes the egg stage of stink bugs by two and a half times. Right? So that's pretty significant. And here you can see that little teeny tiny microscopic wasp injecting an egg into the, um, or injecting its egg into the egg of a, of a stink bug. And what that wasp will do inside that egg is develop and break out as an adult um, after it goes through metamorphosis and then it will eventually kill that pest, right? So fewer pests, fewer stink bugs in the Northeast. I think people will give three cheers for that. Here's another key study. This is a more novel cover cropping approach. We call these insectary plantings. We really beef them up with um, annual flowers and sometimes perennial flowers, depending on the system, that um, provide a burst of that nectar and pollen resources, but a lot of them also have uh, extra floral nectaries, which is a source of nectar on the plant that is especially important during drought um, conditions because the actual flower parts will be more conservative with nectar recharge but we seem to be able to um, hold these insects over with nectar from those extra floral nectaries. They're very important. Um, this is a vineyard and apple orchard. They were establishing, it was a perfect situation here in New Hampshire. They were establishing um, new vines and planting new apple trees. And so as they were doing that, they seeded this ground cover with bachelor button, and other insectary plants, um, buckwheat uh, was one of them as well. So you see you have that flowering row cover and it's very beautiful as well. Conservation crop rotation, so rotating those crops, adding diversity, planting more different kinds of crops is always good. You know, we're always looking at increasing farmland diversity and biodiversity. This also can give rest to the soil. So in a crop rotation, a cover crop can be considered a crop. Also breaks pest diseases in the soil, right? That, that should be common knowledge to most people. Moving around crops instead of planting them in the same location over and over reduces that uh, potential for disease because it breaks the disease cycle. So here's a case study from New York. This is Roxbury Farm. Um, you can actually find this um, in the publication linked below. There's this case study and more. But you can see here the different types of crop fields across this farm. And they were planting a four or five year rotation, which included um, cover crops for green manures, fallow, variety of vegetables where we, they were um, rotating the families of vegetables in different fields to break that crop cycle. So there was, in this case, broccoli, there was sweet corn, and then they used clover cover crops. Um, and in other parts of the farm, they have hayland and then they rest fields as well. So a five-year rotation here, and this map just shows the layout of that. Um, and you can find more information on that in the crop rotation publication. Residue management. Um, so reduced tillage or no-till. Again, practices available under EQIP and CSP. Um, and this also helps to increase soil organic matter, as you can imagine. So frequent tillage destroys soil structure and disrupts soil life. That should be common knowledge, pretty straightforward. Adopting conservation tillage helps with erosion, erosion control, right? 
You can also rotate areas being tilled. Um, not tilling field borders or fence rows can be key. A lot of times you'll hear the saying, the best soils along the fence row. Using no-till planting and cover crop termination strategies and so on, right? Planting that permanent vegetation, again, is, is key. So one way to reduce the impact of cover crop termination is to use um, this here, instead of tilling that cover crop in and incorporating it into the soil, you can use a roller crimper, which just rolls over the plants, breaks the stems and lays them down, and you can plant into that residue. And here's an example of that. This is Campbell Farms in Pennsylvania. They have a 2000 acre diversified farm. This is a conventional farm. Um, and on that, they plant 400 acres of pumpkins, which is one of their biggest um, cash crops on the farm. This particular farmer uh, participated with um, the Xerces Society staff that were part of a project called Project Integrated Pollination or ICP. And what they did was they planted a rye and vetch mix. Um, their goal here was to support pollinators. They recognized um, those soil dwelling pollinators that Jennifer was talking about earlier, in particular ones that specialize on squash plants. Um, and that their tillage practices could be um, harming their nests. So they wanted to reduce tillage to support that nesting structure and protect those nests. But also they provided um, you know, flowers with the vetch for early season pollinators like bumblebees. And they just uh, roller crimpered that um, cover crop down and planted the pumpkin plants directly into it leaving that residue as a, as a ground cover. And so here's the before and after from that. Before um, they were using cover crops and conservation tillage practices, they brought in bees, even though they were likely having populations of wild bees, bumblebees and squash bees and others that are really important um, pumpkin pollinators their practices weren't conducive to the life cycle and the conservation of those species. So they were renting honeybee hives at about $135 an acre. So one hive per acre times 400 acres. If you do the math there, you can see that's a pretty substantial cost for pollination. After implementing these practices, they noticed increases in wild bee activity across their most of their fields and they were able to cut back on the number of rented honeybee hives um, by half. So that's a pretty big savings, right? So these practices benefit a diversity of wild bees, again many of them which are ground nesting bees, um, so they are soil invertebrates and also very important crop pollinators. Conservation cover is another practice um, under EQIP, and there's also CSP enhancements for conservation cover. And essentially, this is just planting areas to permanent vegetation. And there's a wide variety of um, what that is and how that is defined. So there's different what they call scenarios under these practices. And one scenario could be for lower diversity grassland plantings. Right, so it could be introduced grass, like you see here, oops, on um, the picture on the left, or it could be something like um, warm season native grasses, like you see here on the right. And I realize here this pasture grass planting has um, also some, some legumes in it. You could see clover and vetch and other flowers. It could also be for permanent cover and perennial cropping systems. So alleyways in orchards, vineyards, and berry crops, right? So here you see an apple orchard. This is very typical to see those middle rows planted to grass. We have a, a case study here from a hops farm in New Jersey that was really struggling with ground cover in their hops field. Um, just an overview of the farm, it's organically managed. They don't use any pesticides, no herbicides, anything. 
Um, it's in the south part of New Jersey, so they have very dry, droughty, extremely well-drained sandy soils, so challenging conditions. They used frequent tillage to manage weeds in the alleys. They essentially kept them fallow in a, in a tillage fallow, cultivated fallow. Um, and they have had lots of um, pressure from aphid and Japanese beetle pests. And if you think of Japanese beetle being a scarab beetle, their larva is you know, a soil dwelling pest invertebrate, right? Um, so their goals were to build soil, reduce erosion, increase water efficiency, attract beneficial insects for those particular pests, and just contribute overall to sustainable um, climate smart farming practices. So this is what the fields looked like before. This was in May 2019. You can see very dry, no cover. Um, here's the, the trellises for the hops plants. Um, we worked with these producers to come up with an alleyway cover mix that would um, be well suited for their conditions. So, you know, there's a lot of different mixes out there, but they don't work if they don't grow. Um, and also their farming goals. So they wanted something low growing, something low mow, low maintenance, drought resistant, something that tolerates traffic so they could get in there and, you know, manage their crops and also provide cover for beneficial insects. So in spring 2020, we seeded, uh, you know, we took a, a good look at um, species that would thrive in these conditions that would be, that would meet those criteria listed above. And in spring 2020, we seeded with a mix of hard fescue, perennial ryegrass, and lady no clover. Again, a little nectar source for those beneficials and that cover in those alleyways. And this is what it looked like as that cover crop filled in. So you can see this lush, healthy system. They immediately recognized that there were more ground beetles, more lady beetles. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get out, the farm, out to the farm last year with um, you know, the pandemic restrictions to get good pictures of some of these insects that they were seeing that they hadn't seen before, or at least hadn't seen in abundance. And there's another picture there. Much better. Their irrigation became more efficient and they're seeing lots of benefits. Wildlife habitat planting practice 420 is another um, uh, practice that targets wildlife. It's, it's built for wildlife conservation. Again, the establishment of perennial plant cover. This can be herbaceous, um, shrubs, you know, smaller woody plants, trees are not allowed. There's a different practice for that. But there are a lot of options to increase diversity of, of areas that are not in production where you want to provide habitat. Um, so things like these buffer plantings, riparian plantings, right? Very important. We do a lot of these under the um, CREP under CRP, um, in, like I said earlier, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Big push for that. What's nice about these hedgerows is you're creating this disturb, undisturbed environment for these soil dwelling animals like brown beetles and other predators to live. Um, and they can escape disturbance and harm in the crop field when it's being managed for crops but also they're known to move out of these habitats when pests are present, right? And so what's good about this is you may have small narrow areas where you can't necessarily build a meadow or you know, the concept of building habitat might be in your mind to build out. You can build up and you can create that structural diversity, that laying of different plant, layering of different plants from herbaceous to shrub layer to canopy layer, and you're creating a lot of niche habitat niches vertically. So if you have a small area along the farm lane or in your field borders, you can do a lot with that. Similar to that concept, providing these undisturbed areas of perennial vegetation is beetle banks. This is a practice that is um, used much more frequently and people are more familiar with in Europe, but the same concept applies. It's just these areas of permanent vegetation. 
where ground beetles and other soil dwelling insects can escape activity um, or disturbance in the farm field. So harvesting crops, if you are doing tillage, these provide these areas provide refuge. And if you look in this uh, picture here, it's nothing more than a simple grass strip, perennial grass strip. Uh, we recommend using bunch grasses for that, planted on a berm. And what that berm does is provides a little bit um, higher, drier refuge that our um, ground dwelling insects and arthropods like spiders and ground beetles and things like that prefer. So they like that microclimate, right? That dry area. I'll show some examples of that as well. Um, oh, I should say that a lot of times these are, are um, planted within the crop rows, the same distance as the crop row. So it goes from field edge to field edge along the length of that um, crop field. If you have small fields, you could plant these around the perimeter. The reason for including them within the crop rows is so that, you know, these ground beetles can, it's, it's to help them disperse into the crops when pests are present, right? So, you know, they can move pretty far for their size, but if you have a very big field, they're gonna be concentrated around this habitat. So if you have large fields planting several beetle banks throughout, maybe every 200 feet or so would be ideal. If you have very small crop fields or if you have garden, you know, a vegetable garden, Planting something around the perimeter should suffice um, because those beetles will, they have less um, territory to travel, right? To get to all the different um, areas of that field. Um, here's some beetle banks that were installed at Hawthorne Valley Farm in New York. They did several different, and you can um, check out the link down here. Um, to see a report they did on these. So what they were looking at was um, different types of beetle banks. So do we need to plant all grass, um, which is kind of the classic beetle bank. Here they used um, potted plants, transplants, uh, to get quicker establishment. You can plant these by seed as well, although those perennial grasses take a little longer to establish by seed. You can see they have some irrigation lines on here to irrigate those plants, right, until they establish. Once established, you can take the irrigation off. It's not something that you need to irrigate um, permanently, at least in the Northeast. Um, so here they did several different kinds, some with all grass. Some of them, they interspersed some wildflowers to give it a little uh, boost of pollinator value. And this is what it looks like mature, right, again. There's another crop field on the other side of the picture that's cut out. But you can see how these areas of vegetation provide that refuge for not only ground beetles and spiders and predatory um, insects and arthropods and soil insects, but also they have a little flowering benefit here um, for pollinators. So if your crops require um, pollination by insects, this is a great way to increase the benefit and, and get, um, you know, multiple benefits out of one conservation planting. In New Jersey, um, where I'm stationed, I do cover the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, um, and I don't know about every state, so you'll have to check, but in New Jersey, we provide technical assistance for urban farms and community gardens as well through NRCS. And this is mainly doing things like soil testing, testing for heavy metals and contaminants in those urban areas, um, looking at the soil, looking for um, artifacts, a lot of the urban lots that are being transformed into urban gardens. You know, it's very hard to plant into the ground. A lot of those farms used raised beds because under the soil, um, there are structures like old foundations or concrete or other impervious surfaces where it's not ideal for growing plants. There's not a lot of topsoil, but you can get help in assessing what those soils are. And I know in New Jersey, we cover our soil scientists, I shouldn't say me, our soil scientists help in New Jersey and also areas of New York City. 
Um, and this again helps if you are able to plant into the ground and you want to know, are there contaminants in your soil um, that would make, you know, that would impact the health of, of the crops and the edibility of those crops, you, know, you wanna know that ahead of time. So if you are an urban gardener or an urban farmer or a community gardener, look at these resources, contact your local field office and see if they provide these services. Um, I think it's a really great way to uh, look at our soils in, in a way that's a little bit more difficult. Um, if you use some of our apps like Web Soil Survey to zoom in on a very small plot of land and get a, um, a, a soil report of different attributes and soil types and all those metrics is, is difficult on that small scale. So this is this helps compensate for that um, inability to look at that, those reports on, on smaller areas. There's so many more practices I didn't talk about to, um, here today that can be applied, um, you know, through NRCS technical assistance and or financial assistance that are beneficial to, you know, soil health um, and vertebrates are, are packaged in with that. Pest management, you know, in implementing practices that help reduce or eliminate um, pesticides, and especially those that are toxic to pollinators and soil organisms and other beneficial insects. Forest stand improvement, tree shrub planting, the same concept like the hedgerow I showed um, earlier along the farm lane. Windbreaks and shelter belts, you know, a uh, windbreak can uh, make the growing conditions for crops more favorable, right? And it can also be a source of habitat for beneficial insects. Alley cropping, prescribed burning, prescribed grazing, forage harvest management, um, restoration of rare and declining habitats, and so on. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. I will take uh, um, questions at the end if there are any that have um, you know, to do with what I presented here, this content and the material related to NRCS. If you're uncomfortable asking questions that way, um, you can certainly email me what I'll likely do if it's something about programs and practices that NRCS should be answering. Um, not because I can't, but that's their area of expertise and I don't want to misspeak. I'm, I would point you in the direction of someone that can help. Um, but please do get a hold of me if you have questions. I'm happy to communicate with you and help you find somebody um, that could answer those. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly, for, for sharing all of that great information and, and resources. Um, and, and I realized I got a little off schedule with myself. Um, so. I, um, I thought I was running out of time in the previous module, but I was a little bit early. So I'm sorry if I caught you off guard there um, to get started, but um, we're doing good. And it actually makes for a, a good segue. The, the slides that I skipped because I thought that I was short on time actually tie in to what um, Kelly had been saying about things you can do in urban areas more in your garden. So I'm going to cue that up here. Is that looking OK to everyone? It's in, um, it needs to be in full screen. There you go. Looks good. OK, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, again, just showing how we can apply some of these same soil health principles at, in the home and garden. The house that I live in, the previous um, owners had put this landscape cloth or weed barrier down all around the foundation and in the flower beds. And I've been um, slowly working to, to remove that. And as I, I peel it back, you can see that on the right-hand side of this photo, that, that poor soil that's underneath there, I think I would barely call it soil because it's just so hard and so dead. It's been deprived of, it's had cover, but it has not had a uh, living cover. 
or any kind of, of living roots or any way to have animals or invertebrates in there. And so little by little, I'm kind of doing this mini farming in those flower beds where I am putting down uh, a multi-species cover crop cocktail and just kind of letting some life start to grow back in that really hard soil. And then you can also see I'm just doing some surface mulching uh, with, with wheat straw, or also I have some nice oak trees and I, I put those leaves on there. To, to begin to help that soil recolonize and, and revive again. Uh, this is another example of another gardener who has done this multi uh, species cover crop cocktail in their garden. Uh, they just kind of did this as a, a short term solution to provide some weed control and to provide a boost here to things. You can see there in the middle, this is actually in their berry patch. So there's a strawberry plant way down at the bottom of that. And there's some also some ras raspberry plants in here. But this area had become, uh, there had been some Canada thistle that got uh, established in this part of their, their berry patch. And you know, using this cover crop mix for just a few months in the early summer one year, um, uh, was was really helpful to them in managing some of those weeds and then you know, they were able to, to trim it back and let their berries grow there. So just wanted to share those few examples of how you can apply a lot of the practices that Kelly talked about on a much smaller scale as well. Um, and then with that we've got our final open question of the short course to ask everyone to reply in the chat again. And the question we are interested in is to know what particular practice has practices um, related to supporting soil invertebrates have you implemented or, or seen implemented? We'll give everyone a, a few moments here to put that into the chat. So we're seeing cover crops coming in, crop rotation, um, grazing mixes that are also good for pollinators, different kinds of grazing management like rotational grazing, no-till or reduced tillage, mulching. Someone specifically mentioned the, the practice of conservation cover. Permaculture, um, roller crimper, again, that's a method of terminating a cover crop that's, that's mechanical rather than, than chemical. It, it also doesn't disturb the soil. There's no tillage involved. Um, again, more cover cropping and multi-species cover cropping, composting. Yeah, and also a lot about just reducing tillage or going entirely to no-till. Wonderful. Okay, great to see that. Thank you, everyone. And also thank you, everyone, for hanging in here with us. Um, we're just kind of in the, the last little section here. So uh, I'm going to continue into our, our final module, looking at, at resources. So again, I'll, I'll talk through these, but you have been given uh, the link the resources document and that will help you find these these books that I'm showing here on this slide. These are some really comprehensive, wonderfully scientific um, atlases or reports. So the Global Soil Biodiversity Institute has produced this atlas and that's available online as a free download. Also, FAO, um, which is the, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, they've created this current, this really recent report on the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity. That's over 600 pages long, 
um, to give you a, a sense of how comprehensive it is. And then the third book pictured here is a wonderful book of a few hundred pages that's really reader friendly um, by James Nardi. A lot of the illustrations that we've used in our modules and presentations today come from this book. I'm really grateful to Dr. Nardi for providing those because um, not only are a lot of these soil invertebrates difficult to observe, I mean, they're in the soil. You have to, you have to dig around. You have to be lucky that you're digging in the right place and find them where they are. And it's also kind of destructive. Um, so it's really hard to get to picture and visualize what some of these animals are and where they live. And illustrations are a great tool for being able to communicate that. So um, again, there's a lot of really accessible, good information, as well as photographs and illustrations in, in that third book pictured here. Also, another great resource that's totally free and accessible is um, our recordings from this recent um, symposium that was held on soil biodiversity. This was just held last week. It was a full week of, of sessions given by soil scientists and other biologists and conservationists from around the world. And all those sessions have been recorded and are cataloged at this website. And then they also have a resources panel, uh, which includes links to many other publications or websites. NRCS has uh, two pages that are kind of good entry points to learn more. The first is their soil education page. And then the Within that, you can also choose like K through 12 level things or, or college level. And then you've got um, another level that's more suited for professionals. And again, they link to lots of other good resources like the, the ones pictured in this slide. In parallel, but separately, NRCS also has their soil health portal, which takes you to many other tools and links to learn about monitoring soil health, different tests that you can use, both in field and in the lab. Um, so that's a great website. And I don't know, Kelly, if I could, um, don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I know that you also mentioned the NRCS's uh, web soil survey. If you're able to add that link and, and put it in the chat for folks, that would be great also. Thanks very much. Uh, and then I also just want to remind everyone and, and encourage you to think of and remember Xerces and to consider our staff and our publications as a resource to, to reach out to us. Again, uh, the, the Farming with Soil Life Handbook is meant to be a companion to what we talked about today. There are both a version you can view for, for online viewing as well as a version that you can download and print that are available for free. And again, we'll be repeating this type of short course throughout 2021. And each one is gonna have an additional component um, in addition to the core information, we'll have different sections that, that focus on topics like pesticides, um, climate change, another one that, that gets more into to monitoring protocols. And again, these, these will be recorded and organized and available on our Xerces YouTube site. We looked at our, our soil scouting guide. Um, that can help you do some pitfall trapping and interpret the results of that. And I also just wanted to let you know, we have companion guides that also are about foliage scouting and flower scouting, also related to soil invertebrates are a lot of the, the same concepts or considerations for beneficial insect habitat. And we have several different planning guides and assessment forms, and then this um, several hundred page book of, of guidelines pictured on the right here. And that is, that's linked in your information package as well. 
And then uh, Xerxes has a really rich publications library that you can also browse for other related topics and books as well. That's on our website. And um, yeah, finally, I would just again like to thank our grant sponsors, Northeast SARE and Organic Valley. Thank you again to, to Dr. Jim Nardi for sharing his knowledge and his illustrations. And I wanna thank our other Xerces staff, Eric Lee Motter, Emily May, Sarah Morris and Mace Vaughn, who have been key contributors to our soil life curriculum. And I also want to thank all of our other um, donors and foundations who fund our work. And some of our donors are our individuals. We are a donor supported nonprofit, so anyone can become a member today. And uh, here's, here's the link to follow to learn more about that. We also have um, some nice thank you gifts if you choose to, to join and become a member, like some of our books, like Attracting Native Pollinators or Farming for Beneficial Insects. Those are some of the thank you gifts you can choose. We also have a really lovely pollinator habitat sign. And we have that sign available both in English and in Spanish. So again, if, if you're interested in any of those or learning more about joining and helping to support us at Xerces, here's the, the website to visit for that. And I'll, I'll just end here with this quote from uh, N.A. Cobb in the 1914 yearbook of the Department of Agriculture, where he says, the soils of our yards, gardens, and fields swarm with thousands of kinds of minute animals and plants of which we know little or nothing. We depend on the soil for our very existence, and yet this soil that we tread daily underfoot is almost a veritable terra incognita. You know, I think, I think um, researchers and farmers have really helped us learn more in the past century plus, but there's still, I think, so much more to learn and understand as well. But I think we're all really at an exciting place with such a strong focus on soil health. And, you know, it's, it's kind of bittersweet, but due to all the invertebrate decline that's being measured and observed, that's also, I think, helpful to raise awareness about the, the importance and just the wondrous nature of all these small animals. So thank you again, everyone, for your interest in this topic and, and for joining us today. And that will, will take us into our Q&A session for the next 20 minutes or so here. Um, Liz is going to moderate that. So I will hand it over to Liz. Thanks, Steph. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Stephanie and Kelly and Jennifer. Um, those were all really great presentations. And I know we covered a lot of topics um, today. So again, just want to reiterate, if you have any questions um, after this or in the coming weeks, please reach out to us at that email there, soils at xerces.org. Um, and you can also find that on the contact page on our website. Um, and we hope to hear from you and answer some questions and dive a little deeper into all these topics. Um, all right, so I'll start with the Q&A here. Um, and please feel free to put more questions in here. We've got four right now that we'll start with. Um, so the first one is invasive jumping worms have been identified in my area. Can you tell us more about those? And feel free either Steph, Kelly, or Jennifer to jump in. Um, I've got a slide I can share with some information about jumping worms. Let me just pull that up. If you don't mind, Steph, would that be okay if I just Pull it up real quick and then we can go back to your screen sharing. Um, so let's see. All right. So <laughs> this is a really good question and a really good topic. Um, there's a couple quick things to mention about jumping worms. When you're looking for them, um, they've got this white clitellum. 
So the orange arrow is pointing to it in the picture on the bottom, and that's an easy way to recognize them right away from other earthworms, which usually have a darker clitellum. The clitellum also extends around the whole body of the earthworm. Other clitellums of other species just extend around the surface and the bottom is smooth or flat. So that's the easiest way to look for jumping worms. They also have a behavior um, that's really unique. They jump and they thrash and sometimes they'll even lose their tails when they're doing that behavior. So that's also a thing to look out for. You can also look at the soil itself. They leave behind really grainy casts. That's their, um, their waste, their output. And that causes the soil to look a lot like dried coffee grounds. So those are all signatures of um, jumping worms. They are now found pretty much from Maine to Florida and all Eastern states, um, all the way west to where I am in Eastern Nebraska. They're found in Oklahoma, Texas, parts of Wisconsin, um, and have even been spotted in the Pacific Northwest. So if you're wondering if you have them in your area, you can sample for them using what's called a mustard extraction. You can mix a third a cup ground mustard with a gallon of water and pour that slowly onto the soil. Mustard really irritates the skin of worms. So all the worms in that area will come to the surface and then you can look for jumping worms and hopefully be able to visually spot them right away. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to think about knowing if you have jumping worms because they do alter soil structure and soil chemistry. They're particularly damaging in forests because they do consume that litter layer that's really important for nutrients for the plants in the understory of the forest and really important habitat for soil invertebrates and the animals that feed on soil invertebrates like salamanders and birds and so much more. Um, they've also, because they do disturb soil more than other earthworms, they have helped to spread invasive plant species. They've also themselves become invasive. They can spread aggressively because they can survive colder winters in the Northeast um, by surviving as eggs within cocoons and they can actually reproduce without fertilization. So they can move into new areas and outcompete existing worm populations. So all that being said, there's no real good control strategies that can control jumping worms. And all we can do is really prevent their spread further. So this means um, don't purchase worms for bait, especially not eight, uh, jumping worms. They, it turns out they can survive underwater for 20 more minutes at a time. So even if you do use them for bait, don't release them afterwards. Uh, be careful when you're using vermicomposting. Don't purchase jump, jumping worms. Um, when you're buying compost, make sure it was processed properly and has been heated for certain temperatures and a certain length of time to kill pathogens. And then if you're moving from site to site, make sure you're cleaning vehicles and equipment so that you're not um, moving the soil, the cocoons of these worms or uh, in the soil. So that's jumping worms in a nutshell. <laughs> and if there's follow-up questions, I'm happy to take those too, but I will stop screen sharing at the moment. Thanks, Jennifer. That was great. And yeah, any follow-up questions on that, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, for now, we'll go to some other questions. Um, this one is, how would beetle bank be installed with furrow irrigation? And we might not have the answer to all these now. We can always follow up later. Oh, you're muted, Kelly. Okay, I think we'll we'll follow up with that one on email. Um, next question is about beetle banks as well. Would blister beetles use beetle banks? Kelly, you're you're muted. There we go. I know I've I've seen them on flowering plants when flowering plants in particular, things like goldenrod are incorporated into a beetle bank, but I have not seen them, and this may be my own um, 
you know, observation in a, a, a straight grass beetle bank. I have not seen them be a problem, yeah. Nice. Okay, next question is, could you talk more about prescribed rotational planned grazing being beneficial to restore dung beetle populations and reduce parasites in cattle? Yep, this is another really good question. Um, it looks like rotational grazing versus continuous grazing or no grazing increases the diversity of dung beetles. Um, perhaps because rotational grazing favors colonization of dung beetles and this facilitates dung decomposition. Um, so rotational grazing is definitely preferred even when you've got a high stocking rate. If you've got free, frequent rotations that seems to favor dung beetles um, as opposed to continuous grazing. Uh, with regards to parasite treatments for cattle, um, under ideal conditions, dung beetles can control up to 95% of horn flies. So if they've got good moisture conditions and um, lots of resources available, dung beetles can do a lot of the control of horn flies themselves just by removing the food source for horn, um, horn flies and also by sometimes uh, killing the fly larvae themselves to reduce competition. When you've got ivermectin um, used on cattle for parasitic treatments that can significantly reduce dung beetles, and that does um, not only reduce their abundance, their diversity, and their ability to remove dung from sites. Excellent, thanks Jennifer. Um, and then this will be, this is the last question we have in the Q&A right now, so feel free to add more if you have any. Um, this one asks, can you talk about the differences in soil and soil invertebrates based on various ecosystems, such as woodlands, prairie, wetlands, and managed landscapes? Beth, do you want to talk about the soils in those ecosystems first? Sure, I can, I can do that. Um, I think if we, if we just talk about wetlands to begin with, those, are, those have what are called hydric soils. So they're formed and persist under a lot of moisture or water that's um, uh, um, soil is saturated with water. So that changes a lot of the, the chemical processes that happen because they're um, anaerobic, they're not happening in the presence of oxygen. And obviously uh, that, that limits the, the type of organisms that can live in those wetland soils. A lot of wetlands though are, are seasonal or shallow. And so those water levels and the edges of them will kind of, of change over the course of a year. Um, wetlands, also have um, a tendency to, to build up organic matter because a lot of the organisms that do all the decomposition are not able to do that um, in those anaerobic or saturated conditions. So then if wetlands are drained or dried out, a lot of that organic matter um, is exposed. And at that point, you know, the, the soil animal community uh, will all, and plant community will also change. Um, grasslands, I mentioned a bit at the, at the beginning as a vegetation type, they're, they're tied of course to certain climates and both the climate and the vegetation interact to build soils. They often have a lot of organic matter. Again, that's why most of the, the prime agricultural or agriculturally productive areas of the world are in former grassland areas. Um, the way those perennial uh, herbaceous plants, including grasses, but a lot of other wildflowers, the way that, that their vegetation, that biomass grows and then um, falls on the ground and decomposes each year has built them up into really fertile and deep soils. And then I, I, to mention forests, um, forests have a, a different kind of leaf litter excuse me, a different kind of plant litter, you know, mostly in, in the leaves or needles that are, are dropped from trees. And, and so there's a different layer there and kind of microhabitat 
for soil dwelling organisms to, to live in that leaf litter and decompose it as well. Um, I think, you know, glaciation also fits into these. There are some areas of the world that have been glaciated within the past 12,000 years, and those have much younger or newer soils, whereas uh, places that are near the equator or more tropical and have not been glaciated recently, those are highly weathered and oxidized soils. So that's another difference there. Jennifer, you want to talk more about the animal side of that? Yeah, the short story is just that we have a lot to learn about how different invertebrate, soil invertebrates groups vary across different habitat types. But I think I mentioned earlier that there are certain invertebrates that have preferences for certain soil types, like you'll have very unique mite communities in certain soil types. And that's true also for nematodes and can be true for some other groups as well. So um, it definitely the diversity of these groups varies with the habitat type and the vegetation. Excellent, thank you both. Um, next question here. Is Xerces currently involved in any research projects connected to soil, microbial life, or macro slash microfauna? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we don't currently have any close partnerships with research projects on this topic. But we have worked in the past with um, teams that are researching the effect of pesticides, especially in these agricultural systems. And I think we'll be looking to include some of them as guest speakers in a, in a future short course. Um, a lot of our work is on farms that are applying these practices. And in many cases, they're directly involved with with research teams, whether those are academic or, or from USDA agencies that are measuring those. I don't know if, if I answered your question, Isabella, or if you have a, a follow-up um, comment. I think you know, we'd be interested in learning more about opportunities that exist to, to work with either landowners or researchers to learn more. 